So good morning. And welcome to Madeira. How many of for how many of you is this the first time you've been on my campus? Uh, most of you okay. Well welcome. I hope you have an opportunity to, to get around to look around and see the facilities. I think we have great uh, operations here. I'm Dr. Paul Quiet, I'm a professor and vice chair for research in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. I also lead our Health Disparity Research Center of Excellence, and I'm the new director of the Center for Social Determinants of Health. Uh, I have a number of funded research uh, projects and other community uh, projects. So one of the things that I just want to share with you as we start are some of the resources that we have. And, and again, as we look at establishing partnerships with you, uh, we just want you to be aware of them. Mary has four schools. We have a school of medicine. We have about 120 students that go over a year, over four years, so about 500 students. We have a school of dentistry. I think they're about 80 or 85 now uh, per year, so that's what, uh, 300 plus uh, students. We have a graduate school and of uh, sort of biomedical sciences, and uh, I think the enrollment there is under would be under 100. We have a, but we can, within that, we have a public health program, um, and that's small, about 25 students a year. And then we have a new school of applied computational sciences, which was established in the past two years. They already have an approved and accredited uh, a master's program, a master, they have several master's programs, they have uh, uh, certificate programs, like a 12-month data wrangling and other types of things. And they've just recently been approved to offer a PhD in, in data science. So uh, those are the major uh, resources here. Although within the college, we have a lot of, again, academic community and government uh, collaborations and partnerships. In terms of academic partnerships, and I, again, this is an area that I've been very involved in. We work with all of the major academic institutions. Uh, in the West, we have University of Tennessee Health Science Center. We have University of Memphis. Uh, here in, uh, in Central Tennessee, we have, uh, again, Gary Vanderbilt. Uh, we have, a, we work closely with uh, the exchange program at Savannah. We work with Belmont. Uh, in East Tennessee, we have, uh, and I have close working relationships both with faculty and, and researchers at the University of Tennessee, at uh, Knoxville, and at ETSU. In addition, we have very strong partnerships with the uh, four HBCUs, the historic black, historically black colleges and universities here in the state. That includes Le Moyne Ola in Memphis, Lane College in Jackson, and Fisk and TSU here in Central. Uh, we also, in terms of, have, uh, again, we work with a lot of community organizations, particularly in my department, family and community medicine. Uh, we work closely with the Tennessee Primary Care Association, which is a major organization. The partners uh, consist of all the community, or most of the community health centers in the, in the state, uh, across the state. Uh, we work with, uh, again, those individual community health centers, Matthew Walker here in uh, Middle and United Neighborhood. We also work with uh, Christ Community in Memphis and uh, Cherokee Health System in East. Um, at the federal level, again, we have a lot of relationships, ongoing relationships with federal partners. Uh, and you'll hear more about some of the opportunities around the SPIR, SPCR, uh, as a small business innovation research. <laughs> Uh, actually, I know who they are, what they do, but I haven't, I haven't had a chance to invite them yet. Uh, but but uh, each of the uh, centers and institutes at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, has an SBIR contact person. And I know uh, the contact person in the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Security very well. We've actually talked about uh, possibility of submitting uh, SBIR applications, but just haven't, uh, haven't done the call through. So many of the other federal agencies that are in the health space, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, HRSA, uh, and uh, again, uh, some of the, the, the agencies and these other, uh, uh, this would be, what would it be, it's not centers, but 
the, the, in terms of this, uh, we're coming in from people first, they're coming in different branches within the first up and stuff, have uh, their CI bars as well. So, again, these are uh, partnerships that we have. We can put up the phone call to somebody to find out what's going on. Uh, you know, so I'm really excited about this. I think it's an opportunity for us to work in partnership with, with you. Uh, one of the grants that I have right now uh, is called HowSource, and we're doing a lot of public education, but we're working through the uh, small minority and women-owned businesses here in the state, the business association, to engage uh, small businesses in COVID education and knowing, you know, what's keeping uh, a rest of uh, changes are occurring in this area. And it's something that, uh, again, we actually uh, uh, have uh, partners uh, that, that have opportunities with small businesses that work with us uh, to earn enough to make uh, $2,000 in terms of solicitation. So if you're interested in that, let me know, uh, uh, and uh, I can put you in touch with people that are sort of running that component. Uh, just a uh, last word I just wanted to say, uh, not many people are aware, but uh, Nashville, Davidson County, as well as Shelby County, West Tennessee, are in the CDC COVID-19 red zone. So we have, uh, you know, for the past two weeks, the CDC recommends uh, wearing a uh, face mask in all indoor spaces, regardless of your vaccination status. Uh, this is, again, one of the things that is not just to protect you, but to, to help prevent you from getting the, the virus and spreading it to others, and particularly if you're you know, in contact with people that are vulnerable or unvaccinated or haven't been, uh, haven't been boosted in the past six months. Because what we do know is that the vaccine is we uh, get boosted, uh, stay boosted, and if you have children under five, today, the first day, the COVID vaccines are, are available for children under five. Right now, they're working, the vaccines are available through the um, primary, care, primary care providers, the pediatricians. Um, which includes the management of our microgrant program. Uh, so if today you're here um, learning about SDR and think it's a good fit for you, um, I would encourage you all to, to follow up with me and our organization. Uh, and we have a million dollars available to help you all apply for it um, and develop uh, a winning application for that program. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and kick it off over to Jim and uh, we can learn about SDAR. So thanks again for all of you being here and looking forward to the day. Thank you, Chuck. Hello, everybody. You're going to have to listen to me talk for the next uh, about three hours. I'm going to try and make it interesting. We're going to take some breaks, but this is our deep, call it our deep dive workshop. So I know most of the people in the room are more medically oriented, so I'll focus on NIH, which is, which is my specialty. Um, but there are other opportunities uh, in some of the other agencies, you know, all the cabinet agencies, to to submit SBIRs around health, so and especially um, rural health and, and minority health. So I think that's important to know. So just to show of hands, has anybody ever written 
or won an SBIR grant before? Anybody? You, you wrote one. Okay, so I guess I should start with that. But thank you for admitting that. I've lost way more than I've won, so and I'm considered an expert. So that's great. Has anybody won like R01 grants or R21 grants in the room? Like with the NIH? Those? Okay. Right. So, so um, that's fine if you're not familiar with grants. Um, you're, I'm going to go through some of the basics of the programs and get and once again do a deeper dive. Talk a little bit about strategy, but ultimately, I know this will sound ridiculous, but my goal is to convince you not to write an SBIR through this. Right? You're here, and you're like, wait a minute, isn't that the point? But it's really hard to win. They're really hard to write. You got to be the right candidate. I'd rather you spend three hours trying to figure out if this is the right thing for you than spend weeks, months, even longer trying to win one. So, real quick, my background. Um, I've lived in Nashville now 27 years. I came here for graduate school in 1994 uh, to get my PhD in biomedical engineering at Vanderbilt. I ended up spinning off my PhD work. I'm kind of an accidental entrepreneur. That's how. That's when I got into writing SBIRs, and uh, we raised quite a bit of money. Um, this is before there was an entrepreneur center or any of the flash of Nashville. We were just kind of a bunch bunch of engineers trying to figure out how to commercialize a surgical device, which. It was pretty difficult, actually, and uh, ended up not being super successful. We raised a lot of money, but that doesn't really mean anything. Um, we did end up selling the company, but no one could retire to a villa in France, so I had to get another job. I worked for Launch Tennessee for a few years. I had another uh, healthcare I, um, AI company that I started called Raven Healthcare. Uh, not very successful as well. <laughs> I ended up selling that company in the middle of COVID after I trans transferred already over to Cumberland Emerging Technologies, where I... Um, I'm the director of corporate development, so I work a lot now in the pharma space. So if you're ever over by CPT, we're in that we're in the baggage building, which is the where the Union Station Hotel is. It's kind of that bottom floor. The Flying Saucer used to be on top, and Pinnacle Bank is there. So we have a um, we have an incubator on that bottom floor that's pretty much run by Cumberland Pharmaceuticals. But there's a bunch of other little startups in there, and many of those companies have worked on SBIRs and are running SBIRs and. I try and go around and commiserate with all of them and talk to them and inspire them to keep moving their companies forward. So if you're in the life science space, there's, there's an opportunity to have those facilities. So at any time you have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, I'm not wearing my glasses, but I think I can make out everybody here, get everybody's attention, have them here if I need them. But just raise your hand and i um, happy to take a, take a pause and we're going to obviously have breaks along the way for lunch. And, bio breaks and such. Um, so the agenda, so we're going to focus primarily on an overview of the SBIR program, which everybody thinks of it as a grant program, but I'm going to tell you it's actually more contracts. You'll, you'll understand why. What are the different agencies? And once again, focus on healthcare. Um, and then finding different solicitations that may be right for you, because most of the awards I've won have not come from the general solicitation. It's when I find a specific topic that met my company's criteria, and we applied for those, you have a much better chance of winning. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we'll get into strategy. And um, a lot of this I stole from uh, a gentleman I learned a ton from about SBIR named Mark, Mark Henry. I've got a picture of him later, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him. But um, some, of the, uh, some of the things you really got to consider up front, almost like a pre-proposal you'll write, the questions you got to answer. It makes your proposal a lot easier when we plan for these. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about the business model canvas, so you that aren't familiar. I teach uh, an MBA course at Belmont on um, entrepreneurship. I got my MBA there. And um, it talks a little bit about, it's a little bit about more of what these institutes are looking for now. I say institutes, I'm thinking now NIH and NSF, even the agency. They're, they, they are looking more that you've actually like vetted these ideas. It used to be you could just write one of these grants and hope for the best and you get the money. Now they're like, hey, have you actually talked to somebody? Does someone actually want to buy this? And that's really important and it's, it's quite humbling sometimes. But I'll tell you some strategies. You can get it as i -Corps programs, NSF i -Corps programs and some other programs. You're even in our city here at Nashville, or at uh, Vanderbilt about this. And then coordinating some of the statewide resources that Chuck, Chuck alluded to. Um, and then also the timelines around, if you're really serious about this, how do you coordinate something like over the next three, six, nine, 12 months to write one of these? So you'll leave here 
with a good understanding of whether this is a good opportunity for you or you're not ready. You could be ready down the road, you just don't know. Um, some insider advice that you guys taking this are better than probably 95% of people submitting. So just having this experience puts you, your chance of winning goes way up, just participating in this workshop. Um, an understanding of the different environment, um, how you create the right team, that's always important, and then an action plan to kind of write that phase one, which is the initial proposal. So what is SPI or SPTR? It's essentially, it's, the, it's kind of like the world's largest seed fund. It's well over $3 billion. It was created in 1982. It's been reauthorized every five years since. It's one thing that Congress can agree on, senators, from both sides of the aisle, House, everybody agrees that this is a really valuable program. Um, it was created by Bob Dole, the, the Buy Dole Act, um, and I get that Evan Burfi, I think was his name, the senator. And it was more around, okay, there was a lot of technology being developed in universities and a lot of patents be, being filed or not filed, actually. And where, where was this, was any of this getting to market? And they said, we need to have a mechanism by which universities, they started with universities, but it grew, can you know, essentially protect the intellectual property that's created here in the United States using your tax dollars and turn it into small businesses that are gonna help Americans. And that's kind of one of the keys here. One of the keys is you gotta think about is, is this gonna help Americans? This is taxpayer dollars. So you always wanna think that, how is this gonna help different classes, different groups of Americans, your technologies? First and foremost, as a reviewer, I think about that because I know it's taxpayer dollars that I might be um, awarding or, or, or possibly awarding to somebody to, to, to spend. So it's essentially like a big, huge seed fund to help companies. Um, as part of a funding strategy, so we're gonna talk about different phases. It's not the same as drug phases that goes into the drug development or discovery space. It's really all about, it's the phases of the SBIR program. There's kind of three phases, and within those, there's multiple little phases we'll talk a little bit about. But essentially, this money is meant to get you to a point where you can go out and raise capital. So the government is helping you to lower the risk of the technology you're working on enough so that you can go raise capital um, to, to essentially get to commercialization. Now, of course, this strategy of getting through this valley of death, it may take you more than one SBIR. It may take you two SBIRs. It may take you two SBIRs and a lot of frustration and getting a little more money from friends and family. It's, it's not a perfect program. And it's certainly timelines oftentimes are not ideal. To, the two reasons right there to not, to not apply. If, if, if time, if there's a sense of urgency on time and you can go raise outside money, I recommend you go do that. Even if you have to give away a large chunk of your company, don't worry about that. And we can talk that later about venture capital and the importance of that. But this is this this program is really in, it really meant to to um, first and foremost help you define your ideas. This is the other key point that I want to get across. If you end up writing one of these, you should recycle this over and over and over again. If you really put your heart and soul into it and write one of these, this should be your blueprint going forward. You should be able to take this to a venture capitalist. You should be able to think about what can I do with less to achieve some of these goals here to lower the risk? This is an exercise, yes, you want to win, but the companies that I see do the best are ones that have reapplied and won, and then, or also taken that business plan and raised money. Multiple companies I've seen do that. I, I did that with my second company. We ended up raising money when we did win an SBIR based on the SBIR that, that, that we just didn't get funded. And um, I didn't want to try again because I thought, this is crazy, I'm not gonna wait another six months. So this timeline looks great. Hey, you get the money, you achieve all your goals, and then the venture capitalists come flowing in and writing you big checks. It doesn't work that way, the government understands that. So who qualifies? Well, you gotta have a business that's less than 500 employees, I think. And trust me, almost no businesses have anywhere near that that win. Um, I think we've got some numbers here later on the average number. You have to be a for-profit business. Um, there are some rules about ownership. So it has to be primarily owned by individuals now that are US citizens. Um, now, 
can you be owned partly by venture capitalists or can like can let's say Harry invested or had equity as part of a license agreement absolutely um, when it gets to you being owned by venture capital you have to make sure that um, uh, if you're you can be majority owned by multiple venture capital firms that's really only for NIH it's one of the only uh, agencies that does that. Um, so, but the rules are very strict. And actually, the very bottom point there is really important. This just came out, um, and it was a bit shocking to me, but I think there's been some issues around laws. I think somebody studied the law. It used to be that if you had an SBIR and you raised capital in the middle of your SBIR, and let's say you became ineligible in the middle of the grant, you could still finish the work, draw down the money, now they're saying as soon as you become ineligible, meaning you're majority owned by a venture capitalist, maybe that's probably a good thing for you. It means you went out and raised money. Maybe you needed a lot of money. You had to sell most of your, a lot of your company. You no longer can spend the rest of those dollars. You're now obligated to tell the government that I'm no longer SBIR eligible. I no longer meet the criteria. That's really key, and that literally just came out in the last two weeks. So it's just, just something to consider. Most companies don't have to deal with that. There are ways, obviously, you could get around that, but just something to consider. So the different phases. We got phase one, proof of concept, really a feasibility study. You can have an idea on the back of a napkin, but those don't win very often. Even though they say that, hey, you don't have to have any preliminary data, you have to have preliminary have to show give some sense that this is going to work phase two you can get into clinical trials there's there's, a, there's you know up to ten times the money you can do um, you can develop a full prototype you can spend money on regulatory there's all kinds of things you can do in phase two so phase one is more the the really the, the cutting edge research question that you still need to answer that would really lower the risk and when the government funds a phase one, they like to fund phase two. The success rate on phase two goes up considerably. We'll show you that because they want to pick winners, right? Um, then phase three, they kind of expect you to have like figured all this out, raised all the money, you start actually selling something. God forbid you actually sell what you're working on, and you know you just, the sky's the limit. That's kind of the way they think about this. There's a phase 2B program that they created that you can get matching venture capital money that will get you to this valley of death. It will be interesting to find out what happens to that program, those programs where you need matching money. Based on that rule I just showed you, that will be very interesting. First time I thought about that. If you get matching money from a venture capitalist, they want equity. They want ownership. They're, they aren't a charity. They're not granting you money. It will be interesting to see how those rules change with the, with the different follow-on programs that they have. What are the key differences? Everybody just kind of calls it SBIR, but there's this thing called STTR. So SBIR is Small Business Innovative Research. STTR is a Small Business Technology Transfer, right? So technology transfer implies you have a partner that has a technology that has to be a nonprofit partner that is transferring the technology, but they perhaps have resources at that institution or knowledge at that institution that's critical for you to commercialize what you're working on. If you meet that criteria, you can apply for the STTR. Notice that the STTR program is a lot smaller. That doesn't mean you shouldn't apply to it. The success rates are the same, if not higher. So if you really are meet that requirement that you have a non-for-profit research partner where they have to do a, a significant amount of work for you to be able to trans transfer it to your company, you can you can you can apply for that. And you yeah, go ahead. Can you have one of all the tech files and SBIR? Can it can you have both? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. And actually you can switch. Let's say you're phase one, you're an STTR. And then phase two, you could become an SBI, you can apply for an SBIR. Once you're in the program, you can switch between the two, depending on what stage your company is. Yep, absolutely. Um, not all the agencies participate. We're going to go to the agencies. Not all of them participate in the STTR program, only the largest agencies, which includes NIH. So you can do that. Um, 
Another key point. Yes, go ahead, sir. Yes, yes. The, even if the small business, because you can see if you do the math on here, the work requirement, even if the, 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 the small business is only required to do 40% of the work, and the work is defined by dollars, so if you get a $100,000 grant and you need to give $60,000 to Meharry, the grant's still awarded to you. You'll just have a subcontract with Meharry, even though the majority of the money will go to the, to the institution. You can still, the, the grant's still awarded to the small business, so you have to be a for-profit business. The other interesting rule on this, and um, except, for NI, except for NSF, which is a key to note, is that the, the, the employee, we're gonna talk about this rule, the employee, that the, the, uh, the principal investigator has to be primarily employed by the small business for an SBIR. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that, hey, I work 60 hours, I work a lot. I'm just gonna work, I'm still gonna work 40 hours at my current job, I'm gonna work 21 hours at my small business, and that's, that's over 50%, right, in a 40 hour work week. No, you can only work 19.6 hours outside of the business, period. Doesn't matter how many hours you work in the business, but you can only work 19.6. So, and people have gotten into a lot of trouble, had to give the money back, have been, you know, um, have been prosecuted for violating this rule. It's a very, very specific rule. Yes. Okay, so the key term again, if I respond to you correctly, if you're employed by the small business, you can only work 19.6 hours outside of it. Correct. Correct. So, so you have to get a W two from the small business that demonstrates you're working at least 51 percent for the small business. Of course, of course, yes, absolutely. So if you're primarily employed by the small business, 51%, you could get 51% of your salary from the grant, right? I mean, it's it, if it makes sense, you have to have a minimum amount you work on the grant. It doesn't have to be 51%, but that's the thing. You gotta figure out how to make up that salary difference if you're not working 51% on the grant and getting paid 51%. And understand, it's just for a short period of time. So this is a huge hurdle to overcome for a lot of academics to get like released from your institution and do this. It's it's really challenging. Yeah, another question. Two questions. Uh, question one. Um, let's say the like if a, a company or like a, a, a company in terms of commerce or a lab in terms of commerce, high commercial lab, is past phase one, and they directly go to phase two. There is. I'm going to talk about that. That's a great question. There is a direct to phase two, it's called direct to phase two program, where you can, if you can demonstrate that you're uh, through phase one, you can you can go directly to phase two. There are some caveats there, but we'll talk about that. Yeah, question up there. Uh, I have a colleague that's asking uh, if, if this is also being broadcast, they're asking for the link. I, can, can you put that up somewhere? Over there, Launch, Launch is working on that, yep. Oh, oh you'll let that, that, okay. And the slides, all the slides would be available to, of course, you guys. Yeah, don't worry, all this is going to be available, so don't frantically write anything down. Thank you. Sorry, you had one more question, then we got some more over here. Um, let's see, outsource, uh, right, right. So the outsourcing means that you have a subcontract or consulting outside the company. That's another key rule. So let me explain that one really quick before I answer your questions. So let's say the small business is awarded the grant. If it's an SBIR, you can only outsource one third of the money. So if it's a $200,000 grant, only 66,000 or so can be outsourced to um, to either the academic institution or to consulting. There's some rules in there that if it's a, let's say that you need a machine shop that's gonna do standard work. There's nothing special about what they do. It's just, it, 
it's just a fee for service kind of contract, that actually can be, can be considered direct. So that can go towards, that doesn't go towards your 33%. So you just have to be careful with the different buckets of money as you're making your budget as to who, what's going where. If it's going to an academic institution that's contributing to the research, that's, that's considered that outsourced work. Yeah. Questions right here in the front first. Ownership, ownership means nothing. It's all about who's the principal investigator, okay. so who's the PI on the grant. Only that person, they may own none of the company. Yeah. Um, only that person has to be primarily employed. But obviously the PI is the most important position. They're the ones leading all the work. So you can't get you know, your, your cousin Larry to be your PI on your grant and pay him to work at your company if he's not qualified to do it. I have one more question. Yep. Did, did the, um, the the application did it actually have to be like a physical product or drug? Could it be like an idea or an organization for a community, uh, a, a, an innovative community uh, organization that does things that are not like a physical thing itself? Ooh, that's. A that's an interesting question. Is that it, it, intellectual property? It, this is all. <laughs> you know, this is, that, I'm just thinking creatively, like, oh, I have this idea to do something, frame it in a way, or somebody hasn't targeted this group, and I'm going to brand a certain way to do that, and I'm going to make it a business. So that, that's what I ask. And thank you. It's always, I'm going to answer, hopefully, I don't answer too many questions like this, but it depends. I'd have to know a lot more. But eventually, you're going to have to demonstrate how you can sell a product or service. Now, on a phase one grant, you don't have to have a lot of that worked out. But if it if it looks like you're just trying to get money to fund a group to do some work that's maybe not really part of your company, you know, I don't know where this is going, but yeah, that's that's a tricky question. I mean, it's it's definitely possible, but usually this is a, a product or a service. It can be a service for sure. It's a service idea. And it's innovative. It 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 it's going to benefit Americans, and it meets the Institute's goals, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Right. Question back there. Yeah, so some people that were related to some of the certifications you came after. So I understand your PI is more about how much they're working on the project, but we're going after women in business and women, women in small business enterprise, and it's three partners, two females, one male. Um, but the other female has 33% works outside the business. So if I understood what you were saying right, Therefore, she wouldn't qualify because she, she's not working 51% of the business, so therefore I would need to own higher authority in both those partners to make it work. Yeah, once again, it doesn't have to do with ownership at all. Nothing, just, just think about employment. Okay. If she's only working 33% for the business right now, she's getting paid a salary to work 33%. She doesn't meet the requirement of a PI. She could be on the grant. Okay. She could be a co-investigator. But she doesn't meet the requirement. That, that, that's the other point, is that only the, only the principal investigator has to work primarily. You can have a bunch of other part-time employees that work on the grant, um, but they have to be W-2 employees. If they're consultants, that's different. They, they're in a different bucket. So they actually have to be W-2 employees. But only the principal investigator has to be primarily employed. Now, what I haven't gotten to, because you guys are asking such great questions, is for an STTR, except for NSF, for NSF, the PI always has to be primarily employed, whether it's SBIR or STTR, period. The, the, the principal investigator does not have to be primarily employed by the small business. So, aha, so if you're an academic, you start a company, and you want to be the PI on a grant with your company, you could write an SBIR, work 20% on the grant, and pay yourself only as a 20% employee on that. Now, lots of caveats there, because let's say, let's say you're a professor at Meharry, you're working on a technology, Meharry has some ownership in it, you have a lab, you have people working on it, you bring this thing to a point where you want to write an SBIR. Okay, you're like, great, I still have a lot of work I still got to do in the lab here, I'm going to write an STTR 
all of a sudden, trust me, the lawyers will get involved. So they're like, wait a minute. So you're getting money for your small business. You're working over there. So when do you put that hat on? Do you leave the lab and do you go put that hat on and go over here and work somewhere? Or are you doing work for your company here at Meharry and then there's your students, the, the staff, are you exploiting them? I'm not saying anybody is, but at Vanderbilt, so one of my job, I, as a consultant for Vanderbilt, I go in and do conflict of interest review on these type of issues. There's almost never an issue. The faculty do everything they can. But it just, it's just, it's painful. It can be very complicated. Um, but it's possible. You can do it. Um, if your institution doesn't have a lot of experience doing it, it can get very tricky very quickly. People will ask questions, and it, it, it could lead to more headaches than, than you want to deal with. Yeah? I had a more question about outsourcing. So when you're doing proof of concept, like a lot of that work might be preclinical animal studies or things like that that you might go out and find a CRO to do for you, or you may have access to somewhere where you can actually work hand in hand with that institution, like locally or whatever. So I'm trying to kind of understand how, because 33% can go fast very quickly. So um, I wanted to get a little bit better understanding. Sure, of some this, of is, this is, these are great, great questions. That is a great question that comes up all the time. CRO would definitely be considered part of your direct. That would not go towards your outsourcing because it is a pass-through service. You say, I need to do preclinical animal work. If they aren't contributing to the science and the technology, if they aren't adding any knowledge or value, if it's simply, one of the goals of my grant is to, is to do toxicology with my compound, I'm gonna hire you know, CRO A to do that. I have, a, uh, I have a letter here with like basically their charges, their fees, fine. That can count towards your direct. That could be part of your direct work. It's just you're outsourcing a service that is provided routinely across the country by different groups, and you have that. That would not count towards outsourcing. However, if you're hiring a research institution that's going to potentially work with the animals and the drug, who's going to create value, they're going to be doing actual research, not just producing a standard result. It gets tricky there. It gets tricky. You can probably, honestly, you can probably get away with it as part of your direct, but definitely if you're working with an academic institution, 100%, that's always going to be part of the outsourced. It's going to be part of that 33%. That's considered a sub, anything that's a subcontract where that institution has overhead and you're high and they have percent effort and all that, anything that's a subcontract is almost 100%. That's going to be part of the outsourced. Yes, yes, that's another rule. You can't do any work outside the United States. I know on other federal grants you can. SBIR is very strict. All work, whether it's in this, whether it's you directly or in, or you hire somebody, must be done in the United States, 100%. Work direct and the contract. Correct, everything. And you guys are asking, these are fantastic questions. Oh, got more, go ahead. One thing we can have the CI. Has yes. Well, I, that's a good question. I don't know if they have to be. They have to be. They have to be either. I think they have to be a green card holder. I don't think you have to be a U.S. citizen. You have to be a green card holder. At least right? Yes. Okay. You have to be a green card holder. You do not have to be a U.S. citizen. Yeah. Great question. You guys, you guys are really hitting them out of the park here. Um, so, Vanderbilt faculty, as I think most institutions, have a certain amount of days they can consult. So the question is, are you hiring this person as a consultant? Um, if you're hiring them to do any work, like if they're listed as a W-2 employee, they have, they have to report that to Vanderbilt because their time is based on, and their effort is based on that. However, if they're a consultant and you list them as a consultant, 
Note that they count towards your outsource. They still because they're because they're adding scientific value, right? But yeah, you can hire them and they can do whatever they want. What they have to be careful of is obviously if they're taking anything they developed at Vanderbilt and bringing it over to you, then they're then that's going to be an issue for them and it could be an issue for you. So if you're hiring them as a consultant because of their expertise in a field, as long as it's not something specifically they're working on at Vanderbilt, you're just getting their knowledge and their expertise on something new, absolutely fine. Faculty are consultants all the time on SBIRs. They, they obviously have to, it's up to them to report it to their dean and hey, I'm doing consulting in this. But, but yeah, that's, you just want to be very careful that when you, if it were me and I was designing a, a, a contract with them, I'd make sure, hey, this is fee for service. I'm paying you to give me a, to do a service and anything new that's created, I own it. My company owns it. Yeah. And so just a quick piece of the business model. Uh, so that's, that's exactly what we're doing uh, the AIM for contract with the website now. We do the same on SESB and Liberty, and uh, we're working on a data model. We partner with the data science institute, and this person helps us create this data model on the SBCR, and then you know, we still own the entire intellectual property, and then we now hire this person to kind of manage this model that we created as a partnership with them as well. Okay, so now you just complicated things a little bit by throwing the word STTR in there, and you said the word subcontract. With all that, so the SBIR phase one for subcontract. Okay, so uh, are you sub, are you subcontracting or consulting? Consulting, sorry. Okay, I know there's a huge, huge difference, right? Okay, so phase one SBIR, you're consulting. Phase two, are you saying you might go to an STTR? Yes. Okay, if you do that, you have to. One of the rules of the STTR is before they will award you the grant. Going through this with a guy right now who just won a grant down at my my company, Yaya yeah, yeah, Scientific. You guys may have heard of Justin Baba, great guy. Um, he has an STTR he just won, and it's a and he has to. They are getting more strict about. Hey, you have to have the entire sponsored research agreement done in writing, everything completed for an STTR before we will award you the money. Meaning. You've got to have the intellectual property issues figured out. Hey, if it's created by the company, the company owns it. If it's created by Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt owns it, and the company has an exclusive license to it. All that's got to be worked out before they will award you the money. It used to be they kind of give you the money and let you figure it out, but the problem was it would take forever. Usually the university would be the problem, honestly, if you see a researcher wants to get going. Hey, you know, but they sometimes the company's never done this before, so they're trying to find a lawyer and they're trying to so. Yes, if you go, as soon as you switch to STTR and you have a subcontract, that relationship is totally different. There have to be rules around the intellectual property. So if you're just hiring someone as a consultant, as long as you have an airtight agreement with them, then you can absolutely pursue that. Go for it. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think you, now, it, as long as you're not using federal money, if you pay them as a consultant outside of this money, you could actually use the profit to pay them. You can use the profit on these grants for anything. You can go to Disney World, they don't care. Um, so, but as long as you're not using direct or indirect monies that you're getting from the government to pay them, you can hire them as a consultant, absolutely. You just cannot use federal dollars. You can have consultants outside the U.S. You just cannot use federal dollars. Yeah. Is there a No, it's a great question. I don't think that that is a problem. Okay. I've heard other companies do that, and I don't know if they got permission to do it, but they did it. And I don't think it's a huge problem. But if that company is based in Estonia or Hungary, that's going to be a problem. If they, if you have a contract with them and they hire people to do work outside the U.S., that should be okay. Yeah. Uh, these work companies for ten years. So you got to be careful there. So um, 
if you're trying, let's say you're a subsidiary of GE, and GE owns a majority of your company, they would be considered, you'd be over the 500 person limit. So that's the way I think about it. If you're a subsidiary of a large company and that large company owns a majority of you, you don't qualify for SBI. What if you're a subsidiary of a non-profit? But you're, but you're for-profit? Yeah. Absolutely, you absolutely qualify. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah. the for-profit company, well, man, you guys, there's more than 500 employees, but it's not a, I don't, I, that I don't know, but sorry. <laughs> Oh, if it's less than 500, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't worry too much about that. That's, yeah, that should be okay. And if you're, so they, but, so you're a subsidiary of a non-for-profit, but you're for-profit, do they own a majority of you? Uh, right now, no. Okay, then, then that's, that's not a problem at all. If they own a majority of you, that might be a question to ask. I don't think that would be an issue as long as there's fewer than 500 employees, maybe even if there's more than 500, but, I, I don't know. Yes. Maybe you're, you're going to get to this, so I um, can put it off. So, but in thinking about what you can use the funds from clinical work. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get in. We'll get into more of that, or you can talk to me afterwards. Obviously, I don't have time to get into super specifics, but like your questions around, like if if, if I get to something, you got a question. What I do with proof of sometimes there may be technology where proof of concept kind of requires work that's done in a clinical setting. That adds a whole other complexity to the grant. So, if you do any clinical research, then you have to then you have to go to the human human subjects forums. Absolutely, you could do clinical research, hundred percent. It's tough on a phase one because that's probably going to be part of your thirty three percent. It's almost impossible to say that's not cl human clinical research. If you're doing it in house, it's something you can have people come in and you do the testing. But if it's something where you have to work with a hospital. That's not considered just standard care. That's actually considered outsourcing. And probably whatever institution you go to is going to require a sub award. But not 100% not of the time. I have seen companies where it's just a contract. If you have people on the team who, who are on your advisory council, on your board that work in these institutions, that's still going to be tricky. I think it depends on how you on how you construct the relationship. You might be able to consider that direct costs to you if it's a pretty standard clinical study and the questions to be answered are pretty standard um, versus they're actually contributing to the research. You, that would be more of an outsourced. Can I get to the next slide? <laughs> you guys can. That's like the first for me. Okay, I'm gonna try it. Wow. Well, we'll just keep going. Um, I probably answered a lot. <laughs> I'm gonna go through and probably say I answered a lot. Here's one big thing. The different solicitations. I talked about there's this state, like I'm gonna kind of try and keep this NIH focus because all of you seem to be in that realm, but NIH has this omnibus solicitation where anybody can apply on anything. But then you get into all these different RFAs. Hey, we're looking for um, COVID-19 testing, innovative testing, or we're, you know, just whatever is on the mind of the government. They may have particular RFAs or PAs, they're called. Those are important. So those are different things to think about. We're going to go through grants versus contracts. Most, almost all NIH is grants, which means it's your idea. Um, the only other thing here, I added some new changes that are coming. They are actually talking about making multiple phase two awards now to get through these valleys of death. And there seems to be a lot of interest in Congress to make sure that these SBIR companies are successful, right? And they don't want companies to die on the vine because they can't get through this valley of death, especially Department of Defense. Some of the stuff they do has gotten really complex, but that'll be interesting to see what happens with these different phases. Um, there is a lot of scrutiny a lot of scrutiny. I read multiple articles on this, on SBIR companies that end up having relationships with foreign countries, especially China. So you gotta think very carefully during your award if you have relationships outside the US because they can ask you these kind of questions. There's no reason why they can't change the rules and say, who are you working with outside the US? You took our money, what are you doing? 
So I've seen that. Um, also, this is a really positive thing. They're looking at potentially doubling the size of the SBIR budget, not until 2028, but that'll be here before we know it. So the next um, reauthorization, not this five-year one, and it may grow, it may, they may actually start to increase it between now and 2028. So that's another interesting one. There's a lot of interest on the House and the Senate. The Senate will increase it more than the House. So um, I think we covered a lot on this slide. Um, just the key difference is SETR, if you're working with a nonprofit institution that has a lot of work they need to do for you to transfer it to your company, SETR is best. Um, a couple subtle things, SBIR, sometimes investors, they want you to create your own intellectual property. They're like, well, if you're licensing everything from Vanderbilt and I got to deal with their tech transfer office, not that they're that bad, but they have issue. Then, you know, then it's like, hey, what, you know, I, when are you going to create your own intellectual property? What, what am I going to own at this company? Do you have to license everything from Vanderbilt? Like, what are you going to create here? So the SBIR gives you more of an opportunity to build your company there and, and to create your own intellectual property. Um, let's see. Okay, grants versus contracts. Believe it or not, most of the SBIR grant money is in the form of contracts. Why? Because DOD dominates. So their budgets are based on the size of the agency's entire budget. What's our biggest spend in the U.S.? Defense. So they have the most money to spend. They are all about, hey, we need stuff for the warfighter. We need a, we need a better suit of armor. We need better technology around mental health for the warfighter. There are a lot of medical ones, but it's more their ideas. That's not completely the case. The asterisk there is a new program, and I've gotten quite familiar with it recently because I'm helping a client with one of these, and I'll talk a little bit about the Air Force program. That's a little bit more of an open topic. So grants are your idea, but they're reviewed by third parties. Contracts, if you have a relationship with the program manager who's in charge of that contract, that's where you can really start to rack in the SBIR dollars. Not that you should only do it because, hey, I'm buddies with this guy. But if they believe in you, they believe in your technology, she believes in you, she believes that your company's gonna be wildly successful, that it's gonna help their agency, they internally review those versus grants. If you get a grant reviewer that wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, stubs their toe, gets bit by the dog, their kid's yelling at them, and they sit down to read your grant that day, and they're like, I'm just gonna crush this grant, I'm in a bad mood, you're, you're toast, right? If, if, or if you forget to cite that, hey, they didn't cite that, I'm an expert in this, they didn't even mention, you know, I've seen it, and if you're, you're toast, you're dead, it's over. It's almost impossible to recover from that, on that submission. Um, so you gotta remember that. It's reviewed by outsiders, there's a lot of politics. Um, it's just, it's just, it is what it is, that's, that's the rule. Um, also, for a contract, the government can be your customer. That's pretty awesome. They, they, why do they give you this money? They want you to develop a product for them. So if you make it through and you're the best, they'll do a sole source contract with you. Um, different agencies. Uh, we've got, so here, um, sorry, diff yeah, different, you can see the ones in blue are SBIR only, those are the really small ones. Um, the ones in are dark blue, light blue, they have both SBIR and STTR, the ones you'd expect, the bigger agencies have both of them. So um, we're gonna focus, um, oh, now grants versus contracts. Uh, Really, the only one that really has a real mix of both is the Department of Commerce and NIST. You're not, I, I've never seen anybody apply to those. I mean, it's possible to be doing something around transportation, but really, the thing to know is that NSF and NIH are grants. Department of Defense is contracts. That's really the ones you're going to focus on. Doubtful you're going to do anything with NASA. Maybe USDA. I've seen, we've done pretty well in our state at USDA. Very, very small program. Not a lot of money. Speaking of money, here's the split. So now you can see why most of them are contracts because almost all of it is DOD. Almost half of it is DOD money. Um, and the next largest is NIH, DHHS. So um, a 
I'll tell you what, let me get through, I'm gonna skip, you'll have some slides on DOE, but I'm gonna skip, so I'm gonna go through each of the different agencies, but I wanna focus on the ones I think you guys are most interested in. So I'm gonna skip over DOE. Why don't I cover NIH first, and then we'll take a break. Because, and this is the NIH, you guys have asked a lot of good questions. Um, and these, this is not a complete review of NIH, but it's just my take on what's the most critical parts of applying to, to the NIH programs. So first thing to note is, as, the, um, as the, the, the gentleman up here spoke about, is the NIH has multiple institutes. You can see all these on here. Every single one of those in light blue has an SBIR program. And there's at least one person there sitting at a desk waiting for you to call them to tell them about your idea that you want to apply for in their program. National Cancer Institute has a dozen or maybe even 20. The larger the institute within NIH, the more SBIR money they have, the more they allocate their resources to that. There's some very, very small agencies. Um, for instance, uh, um, I don't see it on here. I just helped a company apply for a grant through, um, so it's called ACL. I don't even know if they're mentioned on here. It's, but they're tiny. Like they have one guy at a desk who runs the SBIR program. And their grant application process was the most messed. It was, it was insane. It's not like your typical NIH. They have their own, their own rules, their own regulations. I mean, it was, it was really just unbelievable that, but that's, hey, they can run the program the way they want it. Almost everybody else runs a standard, at least the grant submission process is the same. They each have their own little nuances and rules. And that's why most of them have their own SBIR website. So if you Google National Cancer Institute SBIR, you'll get to their website and they'll explain what they're interested in, what technologies, they may have special applications. This has only gotten better over the years. This new, you may have heard of ARPA-H, which is this kind of like cutting edge, technology, um, basically this was created by the Biden administration based on the COVID response. It's like, we need to get speedy, we need to get technologies to market faster. How do we do that? So they're creating a new institute that has not been created yet, but when they do, they're gonna be big in SBIR because it's gonna be all about nimble speed companies bringing stuff to market, giving them the resources they need, giving them um, outside resources they need. So ARPA H is going to be one to follow for sure. Um, this is the, I just got this slide yesterday. This is the latest budget that I was able to find. So it's a little over 1.2 billion is the program. It's big. Um, so the, the SBIR program now at NIH is over a billion dollars. And you can see the split of the different, um, the different agencies. So you get a sense. NCI is one of the biggest, NIAID, Dr. Fauci, that's who put one who runs, obviously infectious disease. One that's gotten really big is National Institute on Aging, NIA. That used to be a really small program. Not surprisingly, it's a very big program now because more money is being put towards the elderly. We have an elderly population. They have a lot of special calls. So if you're doing anything around elder care, elder technologies, definitely go check them out. So NIH is each, as I kind of mentioned, each of the um, each of the institutes is distinct, but most of them follow a similar kind of format. They all follow the same due dates. Well, not, not most of them do. Um, it, it, it depends, but most of them follow the same dates. Most of the big ones, for sure. They all have the same kind of application. They all. Um, like to, um, they like to have materials on their website that's gonna tell you what they're most interested in. They, most most um, of these program managers, officers, they like to be contacted. There's a few that you contact them at Noodle. I mean, but most of them are get excited about it. They're gonna be honest with you. They're gonna tell you it really isn't of an interest to my institute. And I'm gonna give you guys some strategies how to talk to them, what they like, what kind of format they like to see your technology in, in terms of a clean, crisp summary, which is changing, I'm hearing now, which is changing kind of what they want to see, and we can talk about that. But you should talk to them, they want to talk to you, they're not going to tell you you're going to win, 
They're not going to give you advice on how to rewrite the application. They can't do that because then they have to do it for everybody. But sometimes the officer will tell you more than they should, which is why it's always good to talk to them and get their advice. Ultimately, they don't review the grants. If, if they love your grant, but the three reviewers hate it, they can't save your grant. If they love your grant, and two of the reviewers love it, and one guy trashes it, they might be able to save your grant. Especially if you have a relationship with them and they believe in you. They might, it's the key word, they might be able to save it. Or they might say, you know what, we're not gonna fund this, but I know over at this institute, they're gonna love this. I'm gonna take it over to them and let them score it and them fund it. And they, they can do that. Um, so in yellow, that's the newest, what's called omnibus solicitation. If you're really interested in NIH, write down those numbers and go read those. That is there, it just was released. So you'll see dates in a little bit, but their first grant submission is the, for the omnibus, the due date is September 5th. So that's, most people in the room I would talk against trying to apply on September 5th, unless you've already been working on it for a while and you have a lot of grant writing experience. The next due date is January 5th, then the next due date is April 5th. That's the three cycles, September, January, April. There are intermittent applications due, very few at different times in the year. I just finished this one, this crazy one was due June 6th or something. So, but those RFAs, most of the RFAs and the special, like the special grants will still be due on the same date as the Omnibus, but it's just a special application. It looks a little different. You may have to put in some other information to make sure that it gets to the right person at the right institute who's gonna say, oh yeah, I talked to this guy, this technology is awesome and it fits this perfectly. Then they get reviewers that will hopefully love your technology. They don't get, you know, the other ones you get kind of placed. I, I, I've been placed in some weird study set. I was placed in a study section for a grant I wrote on AI technology for the elderly. And a guy that I started my first company with doing image guided surgery said, hey, your grant was in our, was in our, it was in our section. I was like, oh, we lost. Like, there's no way. They just got a bunch of random, like, they just threw a bunch of random grants into that section. I was like, why did I? He goes, obviously he had to refuse himself. He couldn't review it because he knew me personally. I started a company with him. But he's like, yeah, your grant was in our section. And it was not discussed, meaning we didn't get a score. But you know, you just are like, you want to pull your hair out when it doesn't get to the right people. They have changed the rules on that, where they have an extra page you can add to your grant where it tells you, I want it to go to this institute, and then you can even say what study section you want it to go to, which is which is nice. That's a relatively new thing at NIH. One more slide on NIH, and then we'll take a break. Um, I think is it lunch here, or should I keep going? It, it is? Okay, all right, last slide. Um, this kind of describes the three-phase program that we've talked about. So this, this is the first slide I've talked about money. NIH just increased their budget pretty significantly. It's now $256,000 for a phase one and up to 1.7 million for a phase two. We talked about direct to phase two. Somebody asked about that. If you have completed the phase one work, you can write, go straight to phase two. Caveat there is, you better make darn sure you have a solid commercialization plan, because the phase two grant, the phase one grant is six pages of research. You maybe have one paragraph in there that you can talk about your business. That's all the room you're gonna have. And that's maybe good, right? Because you're trying to sell them on the science on the phase one. But if you go direct to phase two, you better be darn sure that you have a commercialization plan. I recommend if you go to direct to phase two, you have at least one investor, a significant investor. It can be an angel investor, but not your own cold Harry, right? It's gotta be someone, a real investor who can write a real letter of support, an angel network or something, because they're giving you a lot more money and they're risking a lot more on you thinking, okay, this is a person that's never started a business and they're telling me they've done all the phase one and they've written a 12 page commercial, right? Because a phase two is a 12 page research plan and a 12 page commercialization plan. So you've got to have your ducks in a row on that if you go direct to phase two. 
Fast track, I've, I've won a fast track before. Fast track to me is the best. I love them. They're hard, <laughs> they're hard to win. But fast track is you write both grants together, the phase one and the phase two. They score it all as one grant. So if your phase two stinks, and your phase one's awesome, you lose. Then they give you the phase one, and as long as you complete your milestones, and we'll talk about specific games and milestones, then you don't have to stop what you're doing and write the phase two. They'll give you the phase two money continuous. Continuous funding. It is beautiful. It is the best. But we didn't win a fast track until we had a company for two years. We had investors. We, we knew what we were doing on writing these grants. We had a clear, concise plan on how this grant would build on our first grant and give us the momentum to get to commercialization. And it worked. We got it. We got it on the first try. So it's doable. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Yes. Yeah. No, th this is why I, I, I don't understand how they're going to deal with. And I mean, as far as I saw, that rule goes into effect immediately. Like, it's not like, hey, those that already have a grant are grandfathered in. It's like, now, if, I, I think they said if you've already changed status before this came out, you can finish the grant. But if tomorrow you change status, you know, with and you and you don't meet the rules of the Small Business Administration, then you can't spend any more grant money. I don't know how that's going to work. I'm going to keep a close eye on that. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of I, who knows. Maybe it was just some some senator, congressman, somebody just complained and and they said, okay, we got to release this NOT, which is like a just a notice. But it was if you go back and read that notice online, I read it like five times. I was like, wow, that's a that's a pretty strict rule there. Because the whole point is they want you to get through this valley of death. It's, it's not a binary event, right? It's like a transition to you raise more money. Um, there are, I should note, for both the phase one and the phase two, I mentioned up to a certain amount of money. There are certain, um, and they, the, the NIH has a very nice document about this that says which programs are exempt from those totals. You can actually ask for more up to, I think it's up to 325 maybe, and maybe 1.95 million. But you have to, um, you have to get permission, and it usually, like I would call the program manager, but if it meets one of their programs, like if you're developing a drug, if you're developing something that you're gonna need more money in a phase two to be able to accomplish the work, um, a particular disease state or something where they know it's expensive, they will waive some of those requirements. And then if you find an RFA or a PA, like a special one, they may say, hey, our phase twos are three million because we know you got to do a clinical trial. So we'll give you three million bucks on your phase two. So you, obviously if you can find those and you're doing something, th those can be a thing. If there is a phase two B program, which is where you get the matching money. Um, looks like NIDID, which is National Institute of Biomedical Imaging, doesn't participate in that, didn't know that. So just found this slide last couple of days. Um, so um, for those, those, those require matching money, but that kind of gets you through the valley of death and gets you to, um, to, uh, to commercialization using, still using some NIH money. How that changes, what, how that, what rule there is on if you're primarily owned by an investor who comes in at that point and puts in a million bucks and you're trying to get a million dollar match, or I mean, if they're putting three million bucks into your business, they're going to own a sizable part of your business. I don't care how, how successful you are. So that's interesting. Um, and then, um, oh, the other thing about direct to phase two, notice there it's SBIR only. You can't do direct to phase two on STTR. Um, and then phase three is commercialization. But note that the NIH put this in here. They're usually not your customer, right? Because this is your idea. You're going out to the market. It's unusual that you can go sell this to NIH. So, okay, we'll take a pause, grab some lunch. We're going to cover NSF.
and a little bit on DOD, and then we're going to talk about strategy and how to kind of put one of these together uh, over the next hour and 40 minutes. And I will talk while you eat, although I may go grab something quickly. We'll take, we'll start again at 12, it's 12.20, I'm going to start talking again at 12.30.
damage. And if you get a 10, you're gonna you're gonna win. Lower is better. If you get a, you'll never get a 90 because they won't embarrass you by actually reviewing your grant and giving you a 90. But you could create your own score because they do number everything and you could be like, wow, I got like a 67 on this. That no wonder why they didn't they didn't like it. So NSF is is it's just an interesting institute. What my big worry about NSF is if you get have a technology, this just happened to a company I'm working with, you have a technology that that's that's more biomedical device focused, but you still need to do clinical trials, that's the other thing, or even a clinical investigation. And you can't do all that within the phase one, phase two. And your budgets are smaller. You get 275 for a phase one and a million for a phase two. So compare that to NIH. NIH, you can get over two million total for two phases. Here, you get barely a little over a million. And they're pretty hard on those rules. You're, you're, they, they like technologies by the end of phase two to be in the market. And a lot of medical technologies, that's not gonna happen over two or three years. It's just not. And they may be great technologies, and the, and, and the grant money might get, might get you pretty far, but it may not be good enough to get where they like to see their companies be after, two, after three years. So um, the other thing that's interesting about NSF, if you're not aware of this, this is actually a good thing, and I think it saves people a lot of time, and you got nothing to lose is, you have to submit what's called a project pitch. Interestingly, the project pitch looks very similar to a document you would show a program manager if you had a 30 minute phone call with them. So I see no risk at all of you writing up your stuff in the project pitch format, submitting it to NSF, they will reach out to you in two weeks and tell you if you should submit a full proposal. When they first came up with this program, everybody just assumed if they got their project pitch accepted that they would, they would win, right? That I'm gonna win. I mean, they told me to write a grant. No, no, your chance of winning is still very low. But you don't waste your time submitting something to NSF that they're not interested in, or they know just doesn't meet their criteria. Um, I've probably talked to maybe 15 to 20 companies that have submitted project pitches, and probably three quarters of them have got pitches accepted. But some of them, they didn't, and they're like, wow, I'm glad I didn't waste my time on NSF. You know. And whether you get it accepted or not, you can talk to the program manager of the institute, of the, 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 they're called, I, I guess they're called the committee institute, I don't know what they call them within NSF. They only have like seven or eight versus the NIH has like 20 something. You can talk to them and they'll give you really great advice. They are some of the best, they are, they are some of the most knowledgeable SBIR commercialization people in the entire US government. So it never hurts to talk to NSF. Unless you're doing drug discovery, then don't even bother, because they don't understand that, they don't think about that, they don't do anything with that. Here's the different um, proposals, the different areas, I guess you call them, that they like. So you can see there's biomedical technology, there's biomedical, um, biological technologies, there's digital health and medical devices, um, there is some things on robotics, so if you want to, you know, if you have something that is in that space that could be more medical, they, you probably end up in medical devices. But they like, they like AI. They're really into AI and cutting edge stuff that is just way out there, but could really make a huge difference. Uh, once again, the proposals require a 15-page document for phase one. NIH is a six-page document. So you've got to have your story really tight to write 15 pages, right? You can get away with writing six pages and just focus on the science. This, you've got to have some idea of how you're going to commercialize this, which is the other thing NSF is really interested in is, how are you going to get this to market? They're the ones that created the i program, the stuff I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, so the project pitch, um, I'm going to show you I'm gonna show you what the different parts of the pitch are here in a second, but you have to submit this before you, you have to have a approved project pitch before you submit a proposal. 
but nothing to lose, all to gain. Um, it's uh, about 1,500 words, that's it. You focus on the innovation, the technical objectives. We're going to talk about objectives and milestones or specific games and milestones later. The market opportunity and your team. That's it. 1,500 words, pretty much whatever format you want to put it in. I see people do with different headings and, you know, it's just, just a document and you submit it. And they get back to you and they tell you it's a good fit. You're invited to submit a full proposal. They're reviewed internally, these pitches. Not a good fit. You get immediate feedback. Um, you, can, you can submit another pitch, but I recommend you talk to the program manager before you do that. And then sometimes they're incomplete. And they're like, you just don't know enough about this. You didn't really answer. That's, a, that's kind of a caveat, though. If you couldn't answer those questions in those amount of words succinctly, that would be a problem with you and your, how you're getting your idea across. I have helped people edit these, and sometimes I read them, and I'm like, wow, I, don't, I really don't understand what you're doing after reading 1,500 words. So you may need to think a little bit more about your company and, or your idea. Usually they're not companies yet when they're at that point. Um, NSF does, doesn't have deadlines. They have windows. What does that mean? That means you can submit it anytime you want during that window. And it will be reviewed. It'll enter a queue and it'll be reviewed over time. The, the worst kept secret though is I've been on a couple of these webinars around NSF is that they don't do a whole lot in between in, in between or they don't do a lot during the submission window. They usually still wait end of the submission window. So people still kind of consider that end date of the submission window as the due date. Because if you miss that, what they do is they, sh they shut down their submission website at like 5 o'clock p.m. and they don't open it again until midnight the next day. So if you don't, if you know, people are still scrambling to get it in by the deadline of the window. Because if you don't, even though they say, hey, it's rolling, so you, you, know, you just submitted it the next day, so you're just in the next window, you're going to have to wait a lot longer than the people that submitted it the day before. Yeah? I was going to say something that's a little better than submission with the end. Yeah, if you're, if, if, if you're working on a proposal and you're like, man, I, I could submit it, and, and it's a week till the end of the window, but I'd really like to spend more time reading and reviewing this, spend as much time as you need. Submitted at the end. That's not going to make a bit of difference. I don't know if they're going to. It, it, it could have been because of COVID that they didn't get to do this the way they wanted to and have um, really have this rolling and at least have a, a few times during the window where they would compile the applications and find reviewers. I don't know, but it's pretty much not. <laughs> the guy even admitted on one of the webinars yeah, you know, just make sure you get it in by the end of the window. If you submit it a month early, we're probably not going to have time to look at it. Get it. So you're like, geez, what's the point of having a window? But hey, they're trying. Um, everything's in their solicitation. It's very, very clear, well written. It's now NSF 22.5-551 is the latest one. Um, big rule on NSF, remember, if you do an STTR, you have to be primarily, as a PI, you have to be primarily employed by the business. You can't do the academic, hey, I work for the university. You can do an STTR where the majority of the money goes to the university, but the PI has to still be primarily employed by the company. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the i program, which is, which I will say this, if you go through the, the, the process of winning an NSF grant, which is, it's, it's, a, it's an arduous process. NIH, it's almost like, hey, you get your score. Wow, I got a 32. I talked to the program manager. He says it's been a fun. You start high five and celebrate. Next thing you know, they start sending you a few, few documents to sign. You kind of sign away your life or whatever, and then the money's there. They don't really give you any help. They don't, they're, they are, they're trying to be more like NSF. NSF, the complete opposite. They will scrutinize. They're like, okay, we think we're going to fund you, but first, we need you to spend three months. We need to scrutinize your budget. We 
you need to understand exactly what you're doing. They, they will make you jump through so many hoops to get that money. But at the end, you're much better prepared to execute on the grant. And then when you're in the grant, there's a whole bunch of programs they have in. There's Beat the Odds program, there's Boot Camp. This stuff, the companies that have done it say it's amazing. It's like a mini i -Corp program. They're running customer discovery. They're doing things. And if you, if you actually do this before you apply, your chance of winning goes up like quadruple. So if you actually participate at Vanderbilt, they have an NSF i -Corp program. I don't know if it's open to the community or not. I think they, they have more recently been more open to other to companies coming in, especially those with any sort of Vanderbilt connection. If you participate in an i -Corp program before you apply to any of these grants, but especially NSF, your chance of winning goes way, way up. I'm going to skip over DOE. They do have some medical stuff, but they have a couple submissions. I have some due dates on them. One thing I will mention about DOE that you have an advantage in our state is if you can't have which it's that's that's very good for you, right? If you have a relationship with commercial advisor technology out of there, um, I did some work with my company. We actually partnered with the um, National Institute of Health, their hospital system in Bethesda. And what I came to learn is you're going to get the best people, the smartest people that will either assess your technology or help you develop it. But the rules and regulations of working with them can be onerous. So if you are going to do this, you need to plan way in advance. All right, don't be calling the national lab 30 days before the grants due and expect that you're everything you need in place to have a partnership with them. You shouldn't expect that with a university either, but there's more of a chance, especially if you're working with an academic who has some influence. They can pick up the phone and call the dean of their department, who will call the administrator for their department, who will fast track the paperwork, but the lab, forget it. It's, yeah, you gotta start, you gotta have established relationship with them. All right, so DOD, um, you all know that DOD is the largest program. It, they can be both an investor in your company through the, um, through the grant, that's kind of their investment, and a customer. Um, they do all contracts. Uh, they can, you can be sole source, you can win, um, win them as a customer. And um, they do not allow majority ownership by a VC firm. That rule that I said earlier, they don't, they don't allow a period. That rule, I think, only applies to NIH, NSF, I don't know about the other agencies, but DOD, no. Um, you have to be a, a true small business, 51% owned by individuals. The, D, the, the DOD is huge. I mean, they, they just, there's, it, it's just, there's so many people that work at DOD. It's just, obviously, it's our largest government agency. You always think Army, Navy, Air Force, but there's all these other groups like DARPA and um, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. I've seen some cool grants there. Micro Microelectronics activity. I mean, JSAT, Joint SNT Office for Chemical and you know, SOC, Special Op I hear SOC, Special Operations Command. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with DOD. Um, I'm working with a company now. That um, so so this is a this is a, this is a great story to think about with DOD. So they have a technology that can it's a medical technology that can definitely be of use to the military. They've got partners that are military contractors that love it. It's a simple, straightforward device. It works. It, it it's novel. It's just very clever with these with kids. I call them kids. They just graduated. Came up with and. We were talking about NIH, and I'm like, this, it's so simple, it's like not real innovative. Like there's nothing, there's no research to be done. You guys have already figured out how to do this. What you need is, you need, you can just, you probably just, you just probably need to make this partnership work with this company. So they were gonna fund them, and I was trying to help them do a licensing deal, and working on their patent. I was consulting with them, not through Launch Tennessee, just on my own. Then, we decide that, okay, we're finally going to go after SBIR. So we go on the DOD website on September 21st of last year. And the due date for DOD, you'll see later, their cycle is due October 3rd. I just about, my jaw hit the floor. 
there was a proposal on there looking for exactly what they were doing. Like, there's a need for this in the military. This is exactly, it was an army proposal. Once again, it's their ideas, right? It was, it could have, it, it, was, it was like they wrote it, which honestly, some companies, because of the relationship they have with the military, they can, they have, you, you kind of go there, you kind of convince them, hey, I've got this cool technology, you guys need to, you need to give me an SBIR, and they're like, okay, yeah, well, why don't you write up something, and then they'll see that what they've written becomes the contract proposal. Now, they're still competing with everybody else in the country who might submit something. They still have to prove that they can do it, but they this is about, all about the relationship. I couldn't believe it. But we had like 13 days. They didn't have any of the registers. There were, it was impossible, but you're just kicking yourself. You're like, man, even if I looked at this a month earlier, we could have figured out how to get this submitted. But we needed, you need, I say never start before 60 days before they're due. But this one, we would have scrambled because it was just too good. It was just sitting there. So the good news is we have, um, we have turned that we have, we're, we're going to turn this into one of these open proposals. But most of what the DOD is funding is there each year, like I said, each cycle, they list all the things they're interested in. The website's gotten a lot better. I have a link to it on here. You can just Google DOD SBIR. It's gotten a lot better. You can actually click a button at the top and say, I want to only see the medical ones, or I only want to see the, the AI ones. And they've got different categories. And you can go through. If you see something that's somehow related to what you're doing, read it. Chances are it's not going to be. I, I just couldn't believe it when I saw this. I was like, oh my God, this is like, why didn't, why didn't we look at this for a month? Why didn't we think about this earlier? But you never would have thought that they'd be interested in this and someone would have proposed this. But usually when they, when they have that cycle, they're not going to submit it. Unless they get terrible proposals, they're not going to because we thought maybe we'll wait three months and they'll have it out again if they don't get good proposals. But that almost never happens. So, question there. Does a grant and a contract, do they look the same? Are they written up about the same? Or do they look completely different? Can you kind of do like a boilerplate grant and use it and make modifications for both contracts and grants? Great question. They, they do generally, the, the meat of the, of, the, of the submission looks the same. What's going to be different in the military, I've told you how NSF is painful. The military is painful on budgeting and auditing and requirements. I mean, it's just it's just a painful process. You definitely got to get an accountant involved on those because it is just, it can get really messy. Oh, when you win, when you're doing your budget, it's not so bad. But then it's like, okay, now you won this grant, or sorry, you won this contract. Now you're signing a contract with the U.S. government. So it's different. It feels different when you sign that contract versus getting a grant. There's still a lot of rules you got to follow for both, but it's just it feels different, and I think it's it's a more intense process. Um, but once again, the opportunity to have them as a customer at the end is great. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the military. Uh, so you as a company. Uh, retain the rights to all the data. The, the, the government cannot, the government can't, they can't ever really sell the data, but you retain the rights to all your data for five years. Now, after five years, if there's something around national security or something related to that where they think they need that, they can use it for non-commercial purposes, right? And obviously, if you're working on something really sensitive and you have a relationship with the government, they're gonna pay you to, act, to access your knowledge and your data, right? But, but that's just a general rule. So when these proposals come out, which we didn't know this one was available, there's a period of time where once they, they put out their proposals, they give you like 30 days. They usually put them out 60 days before they're due. And which, you know, if you don't know one's coming out, you're at a disadvantage. Some people know, hey, I, I, think, I think DOD's going to put out my proposal. I'm already ready to write it and everything. There, so there's always going to be companies that have an advantage. But when they put it out, they give you 30 days to, to talk in private with the DOD officer, and that person, uh, that person's ultimately deciding who wins. So that's your opportunity in a private setting 
to get to know them, to see if your proposal makes sense, to impress upon them why you, why you can do the work, all those kind of things. After 30 days, every question you ask at that point is, is open. So you ask a question, they, they may or may not answer it. If they do, everybody gets to see the answer. Um, and then there's, they, they still have due dates. We'll go over those a little bit later. So what I want to focus on um, is the Air Force program. So with this company I'm working with, we decided to instead to go after this open proposal. So I've learned a lot about these over the next last few months. And this program has really changed for the better, I think. It's, it's almost like a grant program. It's still a contract, but the Air Force decided, hey, we don't necessarily have the best ideas out there. Let's see what, let's see what these, these innovators have that may be of use to us. So it's called AFWORKS, it's called the program. And essentially, you can get a phase one $75,000 contract with a 15 slide pitch deck. You're like, wow, that's it, that's it. Now, these are 15 dense, these aren't slides you present in a meeting, you know, like this. These are slides that, they, they are packed full of information, but they're still slides, 15 slides, lots of bullet points, lots of pictures, lots of flow, like, you know, there's a, there's a group I'm gonna talk about that we're working with for free that's unbelievable. I can't believe I stumbled across these guys. They're called Parallax um, and Apex. They're this joint group. I got a call this afternoon with their consultant to help me consult with this other company. It's 100% free, paid for by the Air Force. So it's really cool. So I'll tell you about that. Um, but they, you use that 75,000 to go, essentially, to go find an Air Force customer. That's what they want you to focus on. The technology should be far enough along. You can use some of that money for, for technology, but they really want you to focus. Go find, go convince someone in the Air Force that they need tech, that they need this. Um, if you already have that relationship, great, go find more. Or you can go for a direct phase two, which we're considering for this company because um, their, their contracting partner already has a bunch of Air Force folks that are interested in this. We have not talked to them yet, and this is due in like 45 days. We started writing it. But it's like, hey, we need to, if, if you go direct to phase two, you have to have the Air Force customer. Someone that says, I'm willing to test this. I'm willing to use it. I'm willing to try it. Um, usually someone as high up as you can at an Air Force base, you know, obviously the higher the person you can get with the more influence, the more likely you are to win the contract. It's just, that's just the way it works. Um, so you use that 75,000, then, then you can apply for the phase two, which is 1.25 million. And that's where you're really testing the solution. You're finishing the development and testing the solution. And you can get sole source. So you could be, the, if, if at the end of phase two, that, that Air Force is like, wow, this is awesome product. Well, let's sign a contract for you to start selling it to us. So um, lots more about that. Um, Here's a couple of slides I stole from a presentation from the Air, from AppWorks. Uh, you can see they're short. The seventy-five thousand dollars isn't meant to last even six months. Um, you want to get this customer memorandum. That's what we're working on getting right now for this company for your phase two proposal. Um, and notice in the light blue, find a fit between the non-defense commercial product and the Air Force market. They are all about your company being successful outside of the military. So if you have ideas that can be used in the military and outside, it has a specific military purpose, but it could also be, you could also sell it to the general market, which this product you can, um, then that's good. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, phase two, um, you can see that's 750,000. I think I had 1.25. I may have confused that with the direct phase two. Um, it's only 15 months, and um, there you're basically validating the fit between the non-defense commercial product that you've been working on and how it's going to be used in the Air Force. Now, they love it if you have an Army involved, too, and but you've got to have someone from the Air Force. This is their money, and this is how they want to spend it on the program. And it's had a lot of, there's been a lot of controversy around this. You can imagine 
some of these people that are used to winning these big fat contracts from the military and have these relationships are like, why are these little companies coming in and getting, getting this money and being able to do this? Because the Air Force is like, because you guys aren't innovating anymore. We want stuff that's really innovative. We want, we want them to convince us that we need it. And then once they do, we want them to develop it. I mean, it's great. So there's been a lot of controversy around this. People say they're acting like a VC fund and this and, you know, because you know, whatever. It's, they, they've worked through a lot of that and they've restructured this program just recently and they've changed like due dates and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's wild. This, this website's crazy. It's kind of stressful because they have this clock on there where they count down on the previous two. So you don't want to spend a lot of time on there if you're under pressure and you see like 13 days, 12 hours, 46 minutes, you know, it must be a military thing, but it's really good website. That's the site you should go to if you want to look at the different uh, proposals. If, you th if you're thinking about doing AppWorks, um, you know, make sure that you, you go to that website in particular. Don't spend a lot of time on this DOD SBIRSTTR.mil because the AppWorks website's going to have a lot more information and these groups I think I removed, I did remove that slide. I thought I had it on one of these slides, but the group, if you want to look at Parallax, P-A-R-A-L-L-A-X. Um, and if you, so if you Google Parallax, and then it's called Apex, A-P-E-X. They're like, Parallax pays Apex to consult or something. I don't understand how it all works. It's free, and they have tons of resources on there, and you can just sign up just to access their library of resources is really helpful. And they, they focus 100% on Air Force, both open and and contracts and 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 the Air Force ideas, the contract solicitation. They, they they do both. So if you find an Air Force one you're interested in, you can hire them as well to help you with that. But you, they can also help you with the open. And they're not there to write it. They're very specific on what they do. They we're talking to them this afternoon, and we want to get advice on how much we really need to do a phase two. Should we go for it? So the phase two, direct to phase two, I think is a 15 page paper. That's what they call it. And it has certain, you know, sections and everything, but it's kind of like taking the slide deck and just expanding it. But maybe a little more heavy on the research side and, the and how you're gonna develop the technology when you've already identified the partner. Um, real quick, NASA, uh, decent sized program because we spend a lot in space still, even though we're not Musk is kind of taking it over, it seems like. But they have um, smaller grants, phase one, phase two. Um, NASA's all about, obviously, can you, they're gonna be your customer. You know, if you're making it to another space, you know, where else are you gonna sell it, right? So, yeah, you know, but they also are very much about, can this be used outside of space? Um, and uh, what's interesting is, I, I sense that the NASA, from what I've read around health, is they're looking for technologies that are gonna help us get to Mars, period. That's what I'm hearing, is that we need to figure out how to get human beings to Mars. How are we gonna do that over the next 20 years? And obviously health is gonna be a big part of that. How are we gonna get these people to Mars? Um, this is an old, older slide with different focus areas. Um, but I've really heard that that's like going to be a big deal for them. So they're going to be looking at health. If you're interested in health, that being an application around there. Same thing. Their proposals. They only have one submission cycle a year. So if you miss it, you got to wait another whole year. Okay. We'll get to some really boring stuff here just for a minute. And this kind of scary stuff. I just want to scare everybody into understanding that you cannot just decide. I'm going to write one of these things. I'm going to go to the website. I'm going to put my name, my phone number, my company's name, our address, our like tax ID number, and boom, I'm ready to go. Now, there's a ton of registrations. It's, it's, it, it is just painful. And I've seen companies not be able to submit because they missed something. So you want to make sure the, the SBIR.gov website is getting better and better and better at walking you through this. This is really the key, is this slide. You need, obviously you need a company with a EIN, tax ID, or a tax ID number it's called. Now you need what's called a UEI, 
which is a unique entity identifier. You don't need a DUNS number anymore. You may have heard DUNS number for years and years. You can get the UEI when you apply at SAM.gov. SAM.gov is the worst. That's the most painful part of the process. It is, yeah, I see shaking. It is painful. I would not worry too much if you don't have a policy on every single thing on there. And don't expect you as a small business to have completed all that. Do your best. Be as honest as you can. Get through it. Check the boxes. Get registered. Get your, get your UEI. And you're pretty much ready to go. You also need to go to the SBA website to prove that you're a small business and get this control ID. Um, takes five minutes to do that. But SAM is, is the worst part. A um, few notes there I put on the side. Uh, NIH just updated their forms recently. It was a little tricky. There was things around human subjects got kind of just, it just made it more complicated. I don't, I don't know why, but just, you know, it's the government. They have to have something to do. Um, NIH has a new and improved ERA uh, comments portal. When you log in, don't be scared if you've used ERA comments. It looks different. However, as soon as you click on one of the cool looking links, you get back to the old 1997 page that they've had on there forever. So I don't really know what they've updated on now. And then DOD, that disk website is way better than it used to be in terms of nav you navigating through different proposals. Um, so this is a checklist. Focus on, obviously, NIH, which is the second column, HHS, um, and NSF. You can see they both have the same first four requirements. And then, well, actually, sorry, I haven't edited this. I'll have to make that UEI number instead of done. It's just, sorry about that. And then you can see that they, NIH uses something called ERA Commons, where you actually submit the application. There's the different tabs. You fill, you basically write a lot of the documents offline and you attach them as PDFs. It's pretty, it's a pretty good process. Uh, NSF Fastlane still looks like it's, it literally looks like Windows 95. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievably just mind boggling that they haven't updated it yet. It's a little bit, it's a little bit frustrating. Like the tech, you know, it's the big text boxes with the, you know, the, just the weird font and you're like, this looks like, this looks like I'm on, you know, a PC from 1995. But you submit it, you get it in, you move forward. DOD, um, they have the, those first three requirements. You don't use grants.gov. Grants.gov grants is another one I didn't have on that slide. Grants.gov is pretty easy to apply for. It takes like five minutes. Ultimately, your grant cycles from ERA Commons or from Fastlane into grants.gov. Military has their own, that own, their own website there to submit. So obviously, if you're thinking about doing this, this is a nice thing to check off your box first. Just get them done, take a day or two, start the process. You can ask questions. I believe that University of Tennessee, it's called UT uh, Procurement, what's that group called? Yeah, PTAC. They will supposedly help you with all these. That's, that's what I, I, I learned. I didn't realize there was a group that did that in Tennessee. Usually people call me and I'm trying to help them. But yeah, yeah, go ahead. Less concerned on that. Tennessee is PTAC when you start with the Tennessee Tech Institute. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I've seen some companies use one of these virtual numbers that everybody has access to so they can get the code, you know, just to get around that. But there are ways that you can share your account with like a consultant who can then edit the, who has access to it to edit it and change it. But ultimately you have to be the one to submit it and meet all the requirements. Okay, um, I'm just gonna keep on going because I wanna make sure we get through um, at least this proposal part and a little bit of the, um, a little bit of what I core and the customer discovery. So what's in a proposal? First, before we go over that, here's a lot of the weaknesses in proposals. Um, notice there's a lot of the word lack there. So to me, the most frustrating proposals are ones when I really feel like someone has a really good idea, but they haven't spelled out exactly what they're going to do on the grant, how they're gonna prove they actually did it, and what value is going to be to their company, right? They've talked about how great their technology is. Maybe that's been pretty clear because that got me excited. Then I get to their specific aims, and they're like, build a prototype. Specific aim one, build a prototype, okay? You just told me how great this is. It seems like it's kind of complicated. What, what do you mean, build a prototype? What, how are you going to make sure it works? What kind of testing? If, if, if I'm reviewing a grant, it's usually one that I'm an expert in with my background, so I'm like, okay, I'll think about four or five different things that I would consider. Um, so that is really a key. Um, the other problem is uh, the lack of a, of a credible team. It's such an easy disqualifier. You've got to remember, these reviewers, me included, are trying to find reasons to not fund your grants. You don't have to read the whole thing. We're trying to find the one or two things on there that there's no way you're gonna win. And once we find those and zero in on them, we don't, we don't need to, I do, well, most of the time. But you, because if you're, you know, it's like if you have a major disqualification factor, you know, then there's something so competitive, right? So the team is really important or being able to articulate how you're gonna build out the team. Um, but this is, these are generally a lot of problems that people encounter. Here's the typical, this is just a general proposal, what's in a proposal, okay? I've highlighted a few things here. The, obviously, the re, for NIH, the research plan is super important. That's the six page, the meat of the proposal. I usually read the specific games page first on an NIH phase one, and then I go back and kind of, I kind of look at the team a little bit, and I might just skim the budget, but I always read that specific games page first, which is really kind of that technical objectives page, to get a sense of, am I, am I gonna really wanna sit here and read thoroughly these six pages and really understand what's going on, or am I already completely lost? So you can lose somebody like that on the research plan. Everything else can be great, you got great people, you got a great institutions you're working with, all that stuff. Another key piece of this, probably my favorite grant story that I've experienced that crushed me, is the letters of support. I actually I usually read those next after I read this, after I read the specific names, I'll look at the bio sketches. You know, I was curious about the people, what they're doing, what their little because the NIH got to put a little statement about kind of why you're passionate about this. You can really kind of, that's a place you can kind of free flow. Um, the letters, so we were, we were working on a phase 2B grant. We had new investors. We were finishing up our second phase 2 grant, really trying to get some momentum. And our investors were like, you guys are good at winning these. Go get a phase 2B two, two and we'll, we'll, we'll match it. I'm like, cool. So we go and we talked to a huge medical device company in Colorado, I mean huge. And we were in this big room, big conference room, really the table probably cost more than I made like at the company for three years. You know, it's just amazing and they love, love our technology and they wanted to, to you know, and, and I said, hey, can you write our support for this grant? The business development guy's like, yeah, yeah, of course, it would be great. Then the lawyers got their hands on it. So I kept calling him, the grant was due in a week, then it was in six days. He's like, yeah, I got the people looking at the letter. Okay, whatever. I get there, and it was so watered down from what I knew to him and what he was ready to sign that 
I just, it, it just, it was just blah. And I said, damn, look at the letterhead. It's got the company name, all, you know, I submitted it. Two reviewers said that letter was completely worthless. It didn't add any value to your proposal whatsoever. Like they just, they jumped on it. So don't submit a letter just to submit a letter from somebody. It, and for God's sakes, don't, if you are asking people to write letters, if you write letters for people, which you should, and then let them edit it, for God's sakes, don't write the same letter for every person. Because you read that, they're like, well, they didn't write this. You know, they learned it, you know? And, and if it, the letter comes back and it's really not powerful, realize that's an easy strike against you. It's better to just not submit it. Letters of support can can make your application or break your application. If if they don't sense, if they sense you're trying to pull a fast one on them with a partner that may be the partner that can help you commercialize this, that's critical, and that letter doesn't show that, that's just a strike against you. So, um, so I like this slide because Dwight Eisenhower it says, you're preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. So about the letter. Well, if you're working with a partner organization, you, you want the, the, the most prestigious person, but you want them to be as specific as possible. If, if this is a letter where I really like letters on grants, because I, these I don't think they're as hard for them to commit to. If you have a partner that says, that has told you to your face without you having to tell them, or you maybe led them down this road, which would be good because that means you're a good salesperson. Like, wow, if you really can accomplish A, B, and C on this grant, I'm ready to partner with you. I'm ready to buy this. I'm ready to fund you. If they're willing to put that in a letter and sign their name to that, extremely powerful. Because now the government feels like, hey, we're helping them to squeeze the risk out, and they've got a letter from somebody that's meaningful, that's, that says, we want to partner with you. Even better, hey, when you get this grant, we'll partner with you. Or we have already partnered you, and this is the success we've had. You know, all of those are powerful, but it's nice when the government feels, and your reviewer feels like it's something big, and if you get this funding, they're going to be there. And they're confident you can achieve those goals. Maybe they weren't confident that you had the right to get, to had the right phase three partners, but when they read that letter, oh, they've got, or even on a phase one grant, hey, if you accomplish this, this would be a huge milestone in the development of X. We'd be really curious then to help you get through phase two. Oh, well now maybe they'll have a co-investor that'll come in on phase two or a partner that'll help them with this. So those are the best letters. The more specific, obviously, you can get versus your technology is fascinating. Thank you for talking to us. You know, a lot of people can do that. So when you think about the plan, me, I would, I don't, I don't always do this now, and I probably should. Whenever I have to write one of these, I, I would sit down and go through these five questions. And there's also something called getting ready to write that Mark Henry does when I talk about it. So it all has to do with the team. If you have everybody in place, if you don't, you may have to pause. Is this a great idea? I know it's simple, but let's really, you really got to honestly ask that question. Is this something that this, that this group, NSF is looking for cutting edge stuff. They're not looking for the next app that's going to tell you if grandma fell down or not, right? They're looking for super technical solutions, right? Cutting edge, bleeding edge stuff. Um, does the timeline make sense? I hate, I hate so much working with companies here that I don't have great ideas and they're like, I'm just going to go get an SDIR and I'm like, it's, it takes so long and it's so, just, just the frustration and it's, yeah. No, no. I have a slide on it. Okay. I'm going to show you, I'm going to explain to you all the bad things that can happen with the timeline. Because once again, my job is to convince you not to. The timeline is tough. If you have a lot of time and you have a lot of patience and you know you got 
other things you can keep busy with as you're trying to move this. You don't have a family to feed. Other things that you know, you should not be counting on this as your sole source of funding. You just can't. Um, especially if it's if it's good enough that you're able to write this, you need probably a lot more money than you think. Um, do you have a credible team in this area? Do you know the competition? Do you know how many apps are out there right now for mental health on the internet? I didn't, and I was trying to create a mental health company around AI. And then uh, just maybe like, I think six months ago, I saw there's something like 20,000 apps around. It's just insane, right? So what, what's going to differentiate you? Um, do the budgets and the scopes of work make sense? Usually, if you're counting on this money as your only source of funding, your budget and your work, are, your budget relative to the work you're going to do, are going to be, it's going to be out of line. It's usually just the way it is. You're going to be asking for too little money to do too much because you're trying to accomplish so much. You think you can do it. I can do this. Like, I know I can do these aims in a year. Like, yeah, that's only going to take me like maybe, maybe two months. Maybe shorter. Look at that more closely there. You're relying on Vanderbilt to help you. Sorry, I can throw Vanderbilt under the bus. They are not going to get this done in two months to help you. They're not going to do it. They're not. They have no motivation to do that, to make sure that you get this done in two months. So those are the things to think about. So I stole this, this picture from Mark Henry because it used to be that it used to be that NIH and NSF were both due on December 5th. Mark Henry and his wife, Mark sits around in his underwear in Oregon and writes SBIR grants. That's kind of the guy. He's just an old guy, older guy now. He's got some heart trouble. But he and his wife would be so committed to writing and helping people win. Um, they would be, you know, the companies they were helping, it's always Thanksgiving. Hey, we're just going to take Thanksgiving off. Yeah, because it's what, 10 days before the Thanksgiving? We've got plenty of, we're just going to take Thanksgiving off. We're going to spend time with our family. Mark and Catherine, they would work like every Thanksgiving with those grants. <laughs> they, they, but then it got worse because then they moved NIH to January 5th. So now they, their Christmas was ruined. Because that's how committed they were to some of these, helping some of these companies. Because they like to win, right? They want them to win. Um, it's a lot of time. There's a lot of, it's not just, hey, I've heard some people say, I could whip out a six page proposal on a weekend. Good luck with that. You know, have fun. Go for it. We'll see, we'll see if you win, right? I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. And there's a lot of planning that goes into the strategy on when you're going to submit. And I think this is only the second time I've said it, which is unusual since I've been talking this long. But you have to be able to recycle this. You have to be able to reuse this. It has to be that good that you are so proud of it, you are so passionate about it, you are so excited about it, that you can take it and you can bring it to an investor. You can take it and you can bring it to a buyer take it, bring it to uh, um, a contractor and say, I need help with this. You can take it to launch Tennessee and sell Chuck on it. Chuck, I need this. This is what I can do. Come on. How can you help me? I know this will work. I didn't win. I'm going to resubmit. Or I didn't win. I think I can just go raise half the amount of money I need on this grant and I can accomplish these things. Can you help me figure out how to do that? So that's what's really important. Um, Viability. Once again, I like here. This is my. I, I found this picture. Uh, it's actually about in uh, the North City. The guy had a patent on a butt kicking machine. Just, it's, a, it's a patent. I mean, it's crazy. You can go look it up. The numbers right there. Patents don't mean anything. IP is really important. Don't get me wrong. That that's part of the NIH commercialization plan and the NSF. Um, it's part of the NSF 15 page proposal. They want to understand you have protection. But just because you have a patent, is it really novel? Is it, does it have a market? Is someone going to want to buy it just because you have a patent with a bunch of claims? Is this consistent with your business model? Like if you have patents on stuff, but you're trying to commercialize something totally, what, what, what value is that? What, the NIH may not study that, but investors are going to. I'll tell you right now, if you get along, they're going to they're gonna look at you carefully. They're going to hire a lawyer, and they're going to look at your IP. 
So the viability is not just about it. You can have trade secrets, you can have all other kinds of stuff other than patents, but um, the other thing to consider is, is this, are you doing research for research sake or is this going to turn into, are you taking a huge step forward to creating a product that you can sell? You gotta think about that when you're writing these names. You may know, hey, I've gotta get this brand, I've gotta get these things done, and then I know I still have seven or eight other things to do. You should probably even write your phase two, I know it's crazy, you should think about what you're gonna do for phase two. Uh, in, a, in quite a bit of detail, you may only have a paragraph in phase one to talk about what you would do in phase two, and you should, absolutely. In, 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 in the NSF, you may have a lot more than a paragraph. You may have a page, right? They're really gonna to wanna to see that you thought about this. But NIH, you may only have a paragraph. But that paragraph better be, they better be convinced that you know exactly what the plan is. Doesn't mean everything's gonna go right, you all have pitfalls in there. But exactly what the plan is, getting back to that white eyes, what is the plan? For me to get this through to phase two, and then and then sell it. We haven't talked a lot about customer, but I think that slide got moved. We're we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the customer later. Sorry, um, viability. Um, so have you done have you done preliminary work? I said you could submit the stuff on the back of a napkin. Not good. Those don't win. Almost never. Um, we already talked about the patent. I like this one. This, I just took that one from Mark. Will this still be an R&D project when it's funded? Are you going to be doing R&D forever? Are you becoming an R&D mill? Or are you really trying to commercialize something? Right? Um, when we look at technology readiness level, um, there's been talk about this with this new NSF program they have now where they're trying to get better ideas out on the market, and they really are talking more about what does the market want, right? If you're, it used to be NIH would fund these like earlier stage technologies, but now they want to see a good mix of, hey, we've talked to the market, the market really wants this. We've been able to at least demonstrate that somehow through a quote, something to show them that. Um, so, an example, I don't know why these slides, it looked like maybe this slide got messed up. I was going to talk about this slide later. I'm going to keep moving along here. Sorry about that. I'll have to maybe reorder these. But So, now, number three, the timeline and the plan. You asked the question about this, okay? So let's, let's take a typical example. You submit a phase one grant. Um, you're all excited. You know, you really put your heart and soul into it. You take a couple days off. You log in to ERE, you take a couple days off, you're like, hey, that, I'm really proud of this. Let's say, let's say you did everything right. You got a great consultant. The consultant helped you. Followed all the rules, you just you really thought about everything together, submitted it. Now you're sitting there, you log in after a couple days, after a week, it's been assigned to a program manager and it's not getting reviewed for 45 to 50 to 60 days. Then so you're like, okay, I got I, I knew this was gonna happen, I got a plan there. 60 days go by, you're waiting, you keep refreshing the page to see if it's got a score at NIH. Finally, it pops up. You're not going to get the funding. Okay, it's it stinks. It really does, especially the ones that I know work so hard on it, and, and they put everything into it. They did everything right, and you just you still got to wait another week, which really stinks to find out what why you know because then then you get the think sheets they're called or the summary statement, and you got to decide. You know, then you got then it change everything changes right um, on do I resubmit. Do I resubmit to a different agency? I mean, I've seen people take NIH and get funded through NSF, and vice versa. You know, what, what do you do at that point? How does that affect your whole plan? Were you, were you counting on this so much that the disappointment is just too much for you? Because you're gonna have to, if you resubmit, you're gone. You, you, 
product cycle. Sometimes with NIH, I've seen April, you could hit the September cycle because that's a good period. I try and, if you're a first time submitter, I like the April 5th because usually you can get something in by September 5th. If you submit September 5th, forget it. You're not going to make January. You're just not going to do it. There's the holidays, there's everything, especially if you rely on other people because they're like, hey man, I'm taking off on this, whatever. I'm not going to help. I don't have any time to edit this. You know, what am I getting out of it? Maybe a subcontract. You know, so think about that. And you got to think about where does this fit? Are your competitors going to catch up? Are they going to figure this out? Are they going to, um, you know, the companies, the companies, it, it just, it's just, you know, it's tough for Tennessee because the companies out in California win more of these and they get more investors. And it's like, uh, you know, they have that nice circle going, right? Investors fund these, they get SBIRs, you know, they have access to resources that we don't have here. So you gotta, you gotta be scrappy. You gotta think about um, where this fits in the plan. And you gotta recycle the proposal somehow, some way, recycle the proposal. Yeah. Technically, well, I would never recommend that, but technically you can. The reason I would recommend it is there are, well, it, it, it actually is legal. You obviously can't take both. You win both, which I, I saw a company actually once do that and win both, and they, you got to figure out how to take both. No, you can't. You're going to be breaking the law. It's the same work. You know, you change a few things. Don't, don't ask me for advice then, because I don't want to go to jail. Like, I'm telling you no. But NSF and NIH are so different that, um, that that would be tough, and I just think both proposals would be weak. But there's nothing stopping you from running an NIH and saying, you know what, while I'm waiting to see if that gets funded, I could flesh out the commercialization plan part of this, because i got to do that anyway, and then I'll be ready to submit to NSF. I'll, I'll get my pitch accepted. I could see that, but I just think there'd be better stuff to do with your time. If you've been in your waiting, um, what, you know, if, if you win one of these awards, you can actually start working on them early and go at, at your own risk and go back and pay yourself for that time. You can go back up to 90 days. And so the day you're allowed to draw down money, the day you get your notice of grant award, it's like an open bank account. If you want a $225,000 grant, you could go in that day and draw down all $225,000. If you could justify it, you'll go to jail if you can't. But, but if you say, hey, I've been working on this for 90 days, and I'm already through one of the specific games because I've been able to scrap and fight and clear. I can go back and draw down 90 days of expenses for that game and justify it. Now I'm that much closer to getting the grant done and I got some momentum. So there's other things you can do. I, I recommend one at a time. It's just too hard. Now, if a special opportunity comes around or in the process of quote recycling, you talk to somebody who says, you know, there's an inst there's a private institute that the Coulter Foundation may want to fund this. You know, we should put it in that format and show it to them and see what they think. Sure, you can do that. But I would wait, I would at least wait those 45 to 50 days and find out what your score is before you before you immediately think about where else to submit it. And and get some feedback from some external people that you've never that you have no idea who they are and saw your proposal for the first time. So yeah. What about the situation where your technology uh, like the different stack images you could apply to different grants? So for example, maybe there's a network networking engineering component. Sure, that that is not a problem at all. Just you got to make sure the work is very distinctly different. That means are different. The you know you don't want any overlap whatsoever. You got, now, if there's some core software that you're using for different applications, sure, it's got to be modified. Just 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 be careful with that. Talk to some people um, that are good at, at looking at these to make sure that it passes the smell test. So anyway. Then, then if you win the phase one, you got to realize the success rate. I think that's like I left out too. The, the success rate on phase one is like fifteen percent on average. This, these are these are NIH numbers. 
they may be a little bit higher for, NS, for NSF, but let's just say it's around 15%. The success for phase two is 40%. So that's pretty good, right? I mean, if you win phase one, the government wants to fund your phase two. It's still only 40%, 40. So you might get to phase one and think, oh, I'm on, I'm gonna cruise now. And you still only got a four in 10 chance of winning on the phase two. Now, if you take the advice here, that's gonna go, both of those numbers are gonna go up, but still, yeah. Exactly. So you can basically raise, uh, I mean, it's, it sounds infinitely, but like basically people can raise 10 million off of uh, off of DC funding and additionally 3.5 off of SPIR, and that's a legitimate scenario. It sounds, I mean, of course, it doesn't sound like, I'm sure, it, I mean, you can still apply your original there, but, but that may not necessarily be able to get funded. You have to be eligible to sign anything to say you're an eligible company. Technically, you kind of sign it when you apply. Um, but like, for instance, here's, here's a key thing. You guys asked a lot of questions about PIs. The PI does not have to be primarily employed by the company when you submit the grant. They don't. That's, you just have to say by the time you win the grant, that person has to be 51%. Employed. So you can identify a PI who's like, hey, I'm not going to quit my day job, but if you guys get the grant, like I'll, I'll help you with the grant, I really want to do this, you guys get the grant, you got, I know it's only a year of funding for me at 51%, but I really want to do this and I'll come on board. So, the, but you don't have to be, you have to be SBIR eligible when you submit, you, you do. That's that SBC document, that SBC control document. You don't, now, the day after you submit, maybe you raise a bunch of money, whether that rule, that rule, that new rule I talked about came or not, the day you actually are awarded the grant, then you have to recertify. You have to answer all those questions. 500 or less employees, 51% of the PIs, 51% employed as of the day of the grant, the day that the notice of grant award is is finalized. All those questions, it's pretty serious. You can scroll down and you gotta answer those. I would say in the scenario that you talk about, if you can go raise $10 million, and I know that that's just a just a wild number. If you find investors that believe enough to do SBIR, forget it, man. Go go get the capital. Be no, yeah, that's right. That's but still, it's like even three point five. Like okay, sure. If you can go and get that, and you know, I talk to some entrepreneurs that are like, man, they want fifty, you know, they want sixty percent of the company for this. I'm like, do it. They believe in you. Own a small piece of the bigger pie. Don't worry so much about ownership. I really just, that's more me philosophically. I'm willing to sell large chunks of my company if I need capital to be successful. And it's so hard to raise money that if you can get that, you don't want to be, you know, have your arm twisted behind your back. Our, so our first company, we we were really struggling to raise this. Nashville 2000, 2000 um, right? Right before the economy, right before Obama was elected, and there was the huge financial meltdown. So we were um, we were in the middle of all that. We had raised a bunch. We raised over four million in SBI, a million from friends and family, and we finally had an investor that was ready to sign a term sheet. They hated our CEO, so they, they said he's got to go. So we got rid of him. So um, I was the first hire. I worked directly under him. So there's no CEO. They said we'll bring in a CEO. We trust Jim to kind of figure this out right now. And they really screwed us on the valuation. They really screwed us. But I'm in the room with my other five pounds, who were some of them were dead, but the fact that they're still there. You know, like, a couple of them, a couple of them were like, Jim, this is amazing. Like, we just got to do this. The rest of them were like, we're dead and screwed, man. We're not going to settle for this. I'm like, what do you think? Out of the last four years, I've been busting my butt. I don't care. I want a chance to do this, okay? So you guys all have your day jobs. I'm trying to make a company here. So yeah, we're getting screwed on the valuation, but these guys know what they're doing. They're, gonna, they, they're in it for the long haul, right? And they were. They, they stuck through us for the next five years. They helped, they, we did as much as we could, very successful, but we did sell it. They didn't get, 
they lost 90 cents on the dollar, but they're used to that, right? But they, they, they were, I was like, they took so much stress off, you could actually try and build a company and not be out wondering. So I tell people, you go get capital. Go get capital. And if it's smart money, that's even better. Because NIH money is not really that smart. It's not, there's, no, there's no people behind that. It's just cash. They're still counting on you to figure everything out. You know, you still got to go get a board. You still got to do all the things. And you probably still got to go raise capital. Now, you go raise capital with an SBIR in your hand. That helps. But some companies will be, some investors will be like, eh, I see 10 SBIR companies a day. So what's so special about you? You know, like, uh, you know it's just, there's, it's, you, you just have to, yeah, you don't want to get into bed with somebody who's like a shark who's going to, you know, you're, you're going to be wedded to this, this firm who's, who you feel, you just don't feel good about. But we felt, I felt really good about these guys. And they really, really believed in us. But they knew that we were, we were a barrel going over Niagara Falls, you know, and they needed the money. And so that's what it was. Credibility. So we talk about PI. Um, PI is the most important person. The PI does not have to have a PhD. The PI, PI does not have to be the person spending all night coding. Thank God, because I've been PI and I've been using. I've had other people do the good stuff. But PI's got to be got to be on paper capable of executing the plan. They got to have some history of doing that. It's been really interesting. Some of the SBIRs I've written, um, especially since I've been at Cumberland, because we don't publish a lot at Cumberland because we're a private company. And sometimes the reviews will be like, well, this person doesn't have any publications around this area. I worked in a private company for 10 years. We don't publish. We, that's not our job to publish stuff, right? So you got to make that clear on, like, in your bio sketch. Like, I don't publish a lot of stuff, but I. Taking products to market, you know, to convince the review. Some reviewers will not get over that. They'll want to see that you are published and have that. But more and more, we're looking for PIs that can roll their sleeves up and lead a team. Not necessarily roll their sleeves up and be the smartest person in the room. So um, uh, the uh, having the right. The uh, preliminary data, we've talked about that, the facilities and the equipment is important. Um, definitely the expertise of the PI in the area. I've been asked, hey, Jim, will you be the PI on our grant? It's like, no, because I have to quit my job or I have a steady income, come work for your company. And I really don't know any, I, yeah, I helped you write this grant, but I, or I, I can, but I don't really know, I'm not an expert in this. Yeah. You won't be PI, you don't like us? No, I like you, I just, I, you gotta find some, if, if you can't find a PI, stop. Stop writing. Stop even thinking about this. If you can't get the right PI, it's that's a that's a that's a non-starter, right? And it's hard in Nashville to find good PIs. It's hard to find the right good partners. If you're trying to get someone who's outside, and if you look like you know, you don't want to make it look like pulling something together either. It's got to be some cohesiveness to the team. Good partnerships that I've seen that win a lot of grants. I was part of it. Was I was a former grad student of the my advisor. We started the company. I left the I left the academia to go run the company. That's won a lot at Vanderbilt. That's been a very successful story, where you have oh the grad student, young, hungry, taking the risk, has the experience, has learned a little something about business. They've got a mentor. They've created a nice structure here. They've got he, he's, he or she has surrounded themselves with the right people. That's a good. Th those work out better when you can do something like that. Student doesn't have to have a PhD. Be a master's student. Could be an undergrad. Budget. Um, follow follow the rules of the budget. It's very sad when somebody doesn't follow the rules and. The reviewers catch it, and it just leads. It doesn't always lead to disqualification, but oftentimes it does. And there's nothing worse than reading a budget that makes absolutely no sense relative to the work that's going on. It's just so easy to say, 
no, you're not going to get this. I have no confidence you have any clue what you're doing because you ask for X amount of dollars to do Y things and they don't line up at all. So um, the budget takes a while to do. Um, I, I usually write the budget after the first draft of the research plan and I, and I put it by specific aims and think about percent effort of the people who are going to be working on each of the aims. You don't have to go into that kind of detail, but it just, then it makes more sense when you put the budget together. When I'm a reviewer, I look at the aims, I look at the um, milestones, and I think about that. So, um, there, right there. No one will be impressed if you try to do twice the amount of work in, in the period that doesn't happen. Um, bullet points. Real quick, this is Mark. He's awesome, um, great guy, just tons of experience. He's written, I don't know, now at this point, that was when he was with the company. So he let me you borrow these slides with his bullet point process. This is his patented, not patented, but protected kind of process. You should go through these nine bullet points. I'm gonna, you're gonna have these. Um, this is a great exercise. To do before you start writing. If you do these nine bullet points well, you basically have a phase one NIH grant written. And if you can answer these nine questions, try and um, try and um, have it so that it's cohesive through the nine points. You're really close to being done. Don't worry if it's nine pages or ten, or don't worry if it's too long or too short. Just get through the nine bullet points. A um, couple of key ones here. This slide getting the audience interested. That first paragraph is so important. I can't tell you how many grants I've read where the first paragraph is just awful. It doesn't make any sense. I have no idea what they're talking about and I'm supposed to be an expert in the area. It is just, it's every single scientific term they could possibly throw in there and I have absolutely no idea what they're doing. It's over, like I'll be lost. So that's a, that's a key one here. You will get these slides, so don't worry about it this down. Um, this slide, I would say the most important uh, one thing to focus on is tangible, quantifiable milestones. I'll say it again. Tangible, quantifiable milestones. Specific aim, do this. What is the goal? Can it be measured? If it can't be exactly measured, how do you judge success? What is success? Can you prove been successful so that when I review your phase two, I say they hit it out of the park. These guys know what they're doing. I mean, you won't get funded if it's not tangible. And certainly if you don't accomplish it or you don't have a reason why you didn't. I've seen companies totally change their aims and their milestones and win phase twos. Like just everything that could go wrong went wrong, but they totally justified it. Because guess what? In their pitfalls for their milestones, they said, for their aims, they said, well, this could happen, and if it does, then I'm gonna do this, right? Um, um, there, the overall, I mentioned you don't have a lot of room in NIH, but what's the plan for phase two? And especially if you're getting to a point where you're gonna have a prototype, try and give them something. If the phase one, the phase one can be pretty abstract and pretty intense scientific goals you have to achieve that really are critical to success and maybe difficult to, 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 have a, to have a picture of, but if you can then say how that's gonna lead to you having something tangible in phase two, if you can test on a human, you can do animal testing, you know, I'm just using medical, but those kind of things. Um, specific aims, objectives, you know, um, our key, um, there's a little bit more about budget. I mean, most of this stuff is, this kind of just summarizes some of the bullet points, but here's the thing I talked about, if you can draw a picture, it's a direct quote from NIH, reviewer, you know, sure. You always want to have an ant chart to show your plan. I think it's actually required for NIH SDIRs. That's, it's, it's not required on like R01 grants, but NIH, the NIH uh, omnibus solicitation, it requires you to have a Gantt chart. And that should be very descriptive, showing you how, you know, which, what work you're doing, have a star for the milestone. 
Um, talked about the staff. Um, there's an interesting point there at the bottom right. Reviewers will look for gaps or lack of experience. Your bio sketch is a place where you can have a little bit of free, free flow. They have this new, thank you, they have this new statement where you can talk about why you're passionate about you're doing this. Some of the ones I've seen win, they're like, my cousin suffered from this disease and was, was, was going to die. And that's why I'm working on it. I mean, those are like really boom. So the bio sketches can really, you can be a little personal there, your personal statement. You can convince the reviewers that you're passionate about this and you want to do this. So maybe lacking in a few other places, you can make up for it. Bio sketch is like free words. And it's fun. The reviewers like to read that. You know, that's the other thing. It's like the story you want to tell around here, you want this to be interesting. It's, if it's interesting, I'm going to keep reading. The people are going to, if, it's a, if it tells a good story about, hey, we developed this at Meharry, we were thinking about this problem, we talked to this professor, we started thinking about this, and next thing you know, we were testing this in the community, we came up with it. It's, that those are really good. You can tell us, you can try and tell a story. It's a, it's a, it's a process. Um, budget, so the key on the budget is, this is an, um, we haven't gotten into a lot on budget. I have another whole, I have a one hour uh, uh, talk that I just give on budgets. The key on the budget is you can ask, you can ask for direct costs, you can ask for indirect costs, which NIH is 40%. And that is meant to pay for, keep the lights on, to pay for the air conditioning, to you know, it can pay, it can actually pay a part of your salary as the administrator of the grant. If you're looking to supplement, right? As the CEO of the company, it's, it's, it's an indirect cost that you need to do business. The NIH does not want you to scrimp on that. They want you to take the indirect that you need because that's how you, they know a business is more than just doing research and having people spend an X amount of time doing research. You can also ask for the 7% profit which you can use for anything, anything you want. That's the only expense on there you can do whatever you want. Yeah? So you, you were talking about staffing and people. Well, if you're just, you don't have the money and you're applying for a grant, how are you going to, what's the way to pay the staff? So wouldn't they have that assumption that you don't have the students in to help support you? Exactly. So how do you it's tough. If you can specifically, I always say, if you can specifically name somebody that you're pretty confident will come on board and have, even if, like let's say you're the PI, and of course you're like, well, I'm, I'm in the middle of all this, I'm doing it anyway, but I want to bring on a part-time person, and that person is really well qualified. And you don't lie, but you can say, you know, they're, they're a part-time employee of the company. You don't have to tell them that part-time right now is, you don't pay them, but you know, you try and work around that a little bit by the more specific people you can name, even if they're not part of your team yet, the better. Because they know that a lot of companies, this will be the first time they're out seeking money. When you just have a whole bunch of to-be-named people, or oh, hire somebody to do this, you don't have any letters that indicate you have the right partners, those are huge red flags. So, um, I'm probably time, too much time left, but this is an important slide. So. For those of you that are still convinced you want to do this, here's a, this is a great website. Um, I've got it in the appendix or on the last slide. They update this thing all the time, and it's always so good. It's always so clear when things are new. So when it says opens, all that really means is that's when you could actually start, you could actually apply on the day that it opens. Nobody does that. We're applying two months before it's due, or a month, no one does it. But that's the first day that you can actually apply. For the DOD, they actually, you can see that date, uh, September 21st right there for their, for their next one. They will announce the topics by August 20th. So August 20th, they'll announce their topics. September 21st is the first day you can submit but you have until October 19th to send in your, your proposal. Um, so right now, we just closed. What's interesting is 
it says DOD just closed, but I'm working on an open solicitation that now is not due until August 9th. They've never had different dates before in their history, and they just, the DOD just did that. So the one I'm working on for the open actually isn't due until August 9th, which is strange, but you know, they, all these experts that have never seen it before, we don't know why they did it, but they did it. Um, you can see some of them like NASA. I told you NASA only has one per year, not until mid-January. Um, NIH, there's those two dates that I talked about, September, January, and April. It doesn't show, it doesn't go past the end of 22. NIH has a small contracts program, so that's their ideas. You can see that's due sometime around late October. Um, highly unlikely you'll meet one of those requirements, but you never know. Um, Department of Energy, we didn't go over that, but notice they're coming up, so if that's something you think you're interested in, you know you've got a little time. And I think the agriculture, they only have for a year. The agriculture will fund rural health. We didn't go over agriculture. Our state does pretty well on agriculture. We have an ag tech, Excel, we have some ag tech groups. I'm going to speak in uh, East Tennessee about that. Um, notice that there, when there's openings, it's not due till November. So this is, this, this is the next cycle of grants, if you're thinking about get a sense. Most of these most of these agencies, there's just not a lot. There's not you're not going to have um, a lot going on. And they're so small, like Department of Education, a lot of people think, oh, I've got an idea on education. It's a really, the, the Department of Education has shrunk over the years in the federal government, meaning their SBIR program is really small. They don't give out a lot of grants. So they're not a huge grant, um, uh, they're not a huge SBIR granting. Um, I want to get through this because for those of you that are thinking about talking to program managers, so it used to be that this quad chart was the be all and end all, and I'll show you what it looks like. Um, you go to these meetings, like Chuck just got back from a meeting um, with all the SBIR program managers, and they have the rooms where you could go in and make appointments and go talk, right? So I go in, sometimes I was there representing Launch bring in quad charts of different to know and I go and have meetings and you bring the, you show the program manager the quad chart and a little smile and kind of a little bit like oh, wow this person knows what they're doing they're showing me a quad chart more and more I tell people hey get, put a put a quad chart together when you talk to them more and more they actually reach out to their companies and they're like send me your specific names page which is great right and but some of them are like I don't have any specific names here what do I do I'm like well let's sit down and think about it really going to do this you've got to have you got to start thinking about this because they're if they're willing to read your specific aims that's huge right they're going to they're going to give you a lot of advice on that they, they, they want to see what your grants really going to look like not just have one quad with specific aims you know you can talk about yourself and other things but but the quad chart is essentially it's this tool if you google this you'll find them we have some templates but it shockingly looks a lot like uh, the NSF 1500 word, remember the four different sections that I had in space that way, it looks shockingly like the NSF uh, project pitch. So if you run an NSF project pitch, you pretty much have a quad chart written. And you, you don't have to put it in a quad chart, you could leave it in that format. It's just they were, they're used to seeing it like this. But you can see, you've got a place you can put your, 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 uh, your specific aims and what development you want to do. Um, but if the program manager, you talk, you email, says, hey, send me your specific games page, get a specific games page together. <laughs> you know, even if it's not perfect, because they're, if they're willing to, to read that, you know, you want to give them what they want, where, where they think they're going to have the most value. But you definitely, if they don't ask for anything, and they're like, sure, I'll take a half hour Send them to be impressed. They'll be like, okay, this person's done some homework. They know what they're doing. They understand what I'm interested in, how I can help them in 30 minutes. And, um, and so this is the different parts of that. Wow, three minutes for business model canvas. We're not going to get through it. Um, I like this slide, though, really quick. This is uh, Buzz Aldrin. 
Um, so this was part of the reason the NIH, pro the SBIR program came around was, well, well, why the SBIR programs pivoted, I should say, is they're like, there's all these great technologies based from all these companies making all this money. What about going to Mars? Like, why isn't that important? Why aren't some of these other technology things important? It's because there's customers. Customers want that. A lot of customers don't want the NIH SBIR. They don't care about them. They're not interesting. They're not innovative. So that's when NSF said, we're going to create this program. Um, so this is a program, just real quick. They, if you have any NSF lineage, you can get into these i -Corps programs, the regional ones. Even if you don't have lineage, you can get into them. And what's interesting is that PA over there, PA22073, if you have a phase one NIH grant, you can now get an i follow-on funding to actually do the work of i through NIH. And they just renewed that program last year. And it's really to help you in phase one figure out your commercialization plan. I, I bet the statistics are going to show that if you participate in the NIH i -Corps program, your win rate on phase two is probably going to be well over 50%. So that's something to consider. So you guys will have access to all these slides and you can go through them. Um, I've got some appendix slides too. Uh, go, there, there's the registrations again. This talks a little bit about additional resources. There's a, another new program called TABA which if you have an award, you can actually get $6,500 on a phase one and 50,000 on a phase two to basically hire a business consultant to put in your grant, which is unheard of. That's new and that's huge. Once again, NIH is doing this because they realize we're behind the eight ball. A lot of our companies just don't have enough resources to get to market. So that, that's the top. These other ones are kind of more niche programs. Literally one of them is called niche assessment. Tava is the one you want to look up. And you can build that into your budget as a direct line item, $6,500. You have to justify it. Um, and this slide's got some information. That, that site that had all those updated, it's sbir.us schedule, that bottom one there. That's the one that they update regularly with the schedule of the due dates. Really good. So you, and they're, they're, Sometimes they're estimating, but man, they're usually spot on on, on those two dates. So I, I can stick around for a few minutes if people have questions. If you just want to ask questions to the audience, that's fine. I'm happy to do that, but I wanted to be respectful of everybody's time. Thank you. You guys were great, really interactive. Kept three hours. I, I hope this was helpful. If you still want to write an SBIR, that's okay. <laughs> and come, but come talk to me first with your idea or talk to Chuck or talk to people at launch and we'll give it to you straight. So thank you and have a great day. Yeah. So you mentioned, and I, I've heard from others that going through the I-Corps program helps your chances in getting the SBIR more or less independent of what agency you're applying. Exactly. But so if you're applying for a phase one, 99% of that is the research strategy. Where does that fit in? Do you just try and stick that into that paragraph? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, you, you, you definitely, you, that is a key thing. Okay. There's a company, you know, um, have you heard of um, all Very Real Health Anymore? Noah Robinson, he's got the, the headset for the um, people suffering from depression. Mm -hmm. So he did I-Corps before his first, he did an I-Corps before he did an NIH phase, first, first try in NIH. Yeah. Never written a grant in his life. But he had that I-Corps in there and he talked about all the Customers he talked to, and it just was fun stuff. So you have to figure out how to put that in there. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.